Hey guys, how's it going today? Good to see all of you. Um, I know timing is a little bit off tonight, a uh, bit of a hiccup in the road. <laughs> um, today's been quite the day. Um, I, won't, I won't tell you guys all the details about today. So, so, some of it's a little personal, some of it's not so personal. So I guess I can tell you guys about the not so personal stuff. Um, but let's just say today's been all over the place. <laughs> Um, well, you know, uh, anyways, but it's good to see all of you guys. I'm glad to still be here for Bible study, uh, even if it's a little bit later than usual. Uh, I'm still glad to be here and to do this. Um, puts a little highlight at the end of my night that I can look forward to amid everything else going on. So hopefully, uh, you know, despite the time delay, we can still have quite a few people show up and have a good time and fellowship with us tonight. I guess we'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, how have all of you guys' days been? I want to hear about you guys' days. Um, I can talk about some of the things that happened today. I won't talk about all of it, but um, as usual, uh, I start my day by going to the chapel office, of course, so that I can help run the audio for the chapel because we do chapel uh, at the seminary Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So I help run the audio for that every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, however, I was rudely awakened at, uh, gosh, I don't even I don't even know what it was. It was like before seven in the morning. It was something crazy like that. It was it was like way early in the morning. I got woken up uh, because they had to come work on the plumbing in my bathroom. Which, if you guys don't know, the plumbing in my building is horrible, and this is now the fourth time I've had to have them come work on it. <laughs> um, but they woke me up super early this morning to work on it, and I was like, okay, well, go ahead and work on it. Um, and then I went back to bed for just a little bit so I could get a little bit of extra sleep before I had to go to the chapel office. Little did I know that I wouldn't actually be able to use my bathroom because it was going to be completely torn apart. So, like, I had to grab my toothbrush and, like, run <laughs> and go, like, do it elsewhere because I couldn't I couldn't do anything in my bathroom this morning. I had to go use a different bathroom. Um, gosh, so I, I, that, there's all that stuff going on this morning. And then, so that, so that was a little bit of damper on the morning. So then I go to the chapel, um, and chapel went mostly well, except for the fact that the microphone for the president's wife wasn't working properly so of course I'm the guy running audio and uh, that doesn't reflect very well on me so, <laughs> so uh, technically it wasn't my fault technically um, it wasn't in the uh, listed schedule that she was going to be speaking um, so the what microphone was not hooked up that she picked up ad hoc um, so it's the chapel office understood that they talked to me afterwards and they're like, Hey, we get it. You know, that was unscripted and she just went, you know, she wanted to talk and she picked it up, but still then didn't, didn't reflect super well on me. So there was that. So that's, that's a couple sucky things, but don't go, we don't worry. It gets worse. <laughs> um, so I come back to my room and I'm reading and I'm working on homework and stuff like that. And, uh, the building catches on fire. <laughs> So there's that. Um, it wasn't a bad fire or anything. Um, the firefighters came and they took care of it. Um, I don't even know if the fire was that big. I mean, it smelled super smoky in the building. It still does in some parts of the building, but I don't think it was like a real big fire or anything. I think it was just a bunch of smoke from something. I, I don't know actually what happened, but I know that the building, you know, the big fire alarm, right? So then I was like, oh, okay, well, fire alarm's going off. I'll grab my headphones and I'll just walk to the gym and I'll work out. Right? So I'm walking to the gym and uh, the gym is closed because there is a meet, there's a group that meets to do workouts every once in a while. So I couldn't go to the gym. So I'm like, well, this sucks. So I can't go to the gym and I can't work on my homework because all my stuff's in my room. So I was like, well, I'll go on a walk. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's like, it's straight out of a cartoon. It gets so much worse, guys. <laughs> so so I, I decided, okay, well, I can't go to the gym, so I'll go on a walk. So I go on a walk, and a, and a bird craps on me. So I'm walking down the road, and a bird craps on me. And my first thought is, oh, well, I got to go get a shower now. I can't, because my bathroom is completely torn apart. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm like, 
what am I going to do? I got bird crap on me. I can't use my shower. I can't even go back to my room because the whole building shut down because the fire department's trying to put out a fire or something. I'm like, I can't go do homework. <laughs> I'm like, covered in bird crap. I'm like, what do I do? So, I wish this was fake. I wish this was fake. This is all 100% real. <laughs> so, I go to a different building and I, I luckily it wasn't like in my hair or anything. It was like on my arm. So I just go into the bathroom and I just like put my arm in the sink and I wash it all off. And I'm like, okay, well, there's that. That's done. So then I'm like, okay, well, maybe the gym's open now. So I go back and I, I do my workout and everything like that. Um, and then, you know, things start to get a little bit better. I mean, this is like pretty close to getting close to Bible study and everything. Um, so I get done at the gym. And by this time, I'm allowed to go back in my building. The fire department's gone. So I come back to the building um, I, you know, uh, work on, I eat dinner, all that stuff. And then I'm like, well, I really got to take a shower still. Cause I just, I, you know, I can't use my bathroom and I just got sweaty at the gym. So I, you know, text a couple friends and stuff and I'm like, well, are you guys around? And they're like, well, no, we're not on campus right now. But they told me, they said the student center has showers in the basement, in the locker rooms. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. So I, I was like, okay, well, I'll go shower at the student center. It, it was pretty bad showers, but I mean, whatever. I needed a shower. It worked out. Um, so then I'm on my way back. Um, after my shower, I'm getting ready for Bible study. And this is the personal stuff I can't talk about, but there was a really hard phone call I just had to take, which is why I'm late for stream. Um, it's not. It's nothing too horrible. Um, like, no, no one died or you know, is sick or anything like that. Uh, just something really hard happened um, to a friend. Um, and I had to stay on the phone with them for a little while to help them out through that and talk with them and everything. Um, I won't go into all the details there or who it was or anything like that. Um, obviously, that's all personal information. But I just want to let you, but that's uh, also what happened right during whenever stream was supposed to happen. So I apologize. That's why I'm a little bit late tonight. Um, I'm not sure if we'll end up getting anybody because we're about an hour late. But, you know, hopefully people will still be able to pour in and we'll be able to have a good Bible study just a little bit later than usual, hopefully. Um, but that's my day. <laughs> so if you feel like you had a really bad day, I'm not sure that it's worse than mine. <laughs> um, my, my day was... Uh, well, my day had a lot of really crappy things, but uh, I'm able to have a smile about it. You know, it was it was so comically like it was so comically bad that I can only look back on it and laugh. You know, bird crapped on me, building caught on fire, sh bathroom is unusable. You know, <laughs> like back to back to back horrible things. And like they all lined up in such a horrible way, too, because I couldn't eat like I had. Oh, that's the other thing I forgot to say. The building caught on fire right as I finished my food. So I couldn't even eat my dinner. I had to leave my dinner in the room so that it could get cold. So whenever I came back after the, everything was over, I had to throw it out and get new food. Oh my gosh. It was like everything lined up just to be so horrible. Like making my dinner for the fire to happen, to go outside, to not be able to go to the gym, to go on a walk to get crapped on by a bird, to then not be able to shower because my bathroom is under... Oh my gosh. Ugh, horrible. Anyways. Um, but uh, I'm able to laugh through it and to have a good time nonetheless uh, because I have realized, reflecting on it, you know, uh, God still finds ways to make me smile. Um, God still finds ways to make me smile and he still shows many blessings. Uh, even whenever bad things are happening in my life, God still finds ways to bless me and to put a smile on my face. So I hope this can be an encouragement to anybody listening that despite what's going on in your life, despite how bad things might get, God is still there for you. God loves you very much. And he can still bring you joy in the midst of the worst situations. Um, so anyways... I hope that all of you guys are having a good day, and uh, I guess I will pray us in, and we can get started. Uh, so if you'll join me in prayer real quick, 
Uh, Father in heaven, thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for being able to gather here uh, into fellowship and to read your word and to learn something from it. I pray that even despite delays and everything, you know, trying to get in the way of this Bible study, I pray that we can still meet here um, despite the delay, uh, despite everything that's going on. I pray that uh, we can still meet here and we can have a good time nonetheless. And I pray that, you know, maybe even starting this stream late will lead us to be able to talk to someone who we wouldn't be able to otherwise. I know that you work in mysterious ways and you can make all things work together for your good. And maybe, just maybe, us being late here tonight due to unforeseen circumstances can lead us to spreading the gospel message to somebody who really needs to hear it at a time when we wouldn't normally get them. I don't know. Maybe that's not in your plan at all. Maybe it's something else entirely, or who knows. But I thank you for putting a smile on my face nonetheless and for being able to be able to do this despite everything that's going on today, despite all the interruptions, despite all the things that are going on in my life. I thank you for this opportunity to be here to talk with amazing people and amazing friends about your word. And I pray that every single one of us will gain something out of this conversation. I pray that you will speak through me and through everybody here that we might have an amazing conversation, an amazing time. Um, and that this, might, this might be a place where, this, where your kingdom is furthered on this earth. We pray all of these things in your name. Amen. So, um, let me swap over here real quick. Um, we have a longer section today. Um, so, we are going to be starting in Exodus chapter 20, verse 22, right here in the law concerning the altar section. And we're going to read through quite a bit. <laughs> and we are going to end here in chapter 23, verse 20. Um, so in the middle of chapter 20 and in the middle of chapter 23 is where we're going to be going through. Um, the reason for this, I guess we will see as we begin reading. Um, but if you guys are new here and you don't know how we do this, uh, essentially what we do is we first of all read through the passage at face value on its, on its own. Um, so we just read through the passage. We let God speak to us first by reading his word uh, straight through. And then after we've read through the passage once, we go back through the passage and we uh, ask questions, we make comments on things that stood out to us, uh, and we ask if there's anything that concerns us. You know, there's a lot of weird things that happen in this culture that we don't really understand, and uh, some of it's a little bit concerning. So, you know, let's talk about it. Let's have a great time. So as I read through this, feel free to read along with me in your own. If you have a physical Bible with you, you can read along with this with us in that. Or if you want to read along with me on the screen, feel free to do that as well. If you have a different translation and you see interesting things that are translated in different ways, feel free to point them out and we can talk about it. I'd love to do that. Um, but yeah, so we're going to start here in Exodus chapter 20, verse 22. We're going to read all the way through. And uh, yeah. This will be a great time. Also, Cole, good to see you. Uh, it's good to very, it's very, very good to see you. I'm glad that you're here, man. We got an interesting section tonight. This might be one that you enjoy. So a lot of like cultural weird things. So let me start reading here, 20 verse 22. And we're going to go for a couple chapters and then I'll uh, tell us when we're going to end. And as I read through, like I said, think of uh, things that stick out to you that you can make comment on or think about questions. If there's anything you have questions about while we read through, keep those in mind so you can ask them when we're done. And um, yeah, all that good stuff. So I'm going to start reading and feel free to follow along. The Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, You have seen for yourselves that I spoke with you from heaven. You shall not make gods of silver alongside me, nor shall you make for yourselves gods of gold. You need make for me only an altar of earth and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your offerings of well-being. Your sheep and your oxen in every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. But if you make for me an altar of stone, do not build it of he hewn stones. For if you use a chisel upon it, you profane it. You shall not go up by steps to my altar, so that your nakedness may not be exposed upon it. These are the ordinances that you shall set before them. When you buy a male Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, but in the seventh he shall go out a free person, without debt. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife, and she bears him sons and daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. 
But if the slave declares, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out a free person, then his master shall bring him before God. He shall be brought to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him for life. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master who designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people, since he has dealt unfairly with her. If he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her as with a daughter. If he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish the food, clothing, or marital rights of his first wife. And if he does not do these th three things for her, he shall go out without. She shall go out without debt, without payment of money. Whoever strikes a person mortally shall be put to death. If it was a pre, if it was not premeditated, but came about as by an act of God, then I will appoint for you a place to which the killer may flee. But if someone willfully attacks and kills another by treachery, you shall take the killer from my altar for execution. Whoever strikes father or mother shall be put to death. Whoever kidnaps a person, whether that person has been sold or is still held in possession, shall be put to death. Whoever curses father or mother shall be put to death. When individuals quarrel, and one strikes the other with a stone or fist so that the injured party, though not dead, is confined to bed, but recovers and walks around outside with the help of a staff, then the assailant shall be free of liability except to pay for the loss of time and to arrange for full recovery. When a slave owner strikes a male or female slave with a rod and the slave dies immediately, the owner shall be punished. But if the slave survives a day or two, there is no punishment, for the slave is the owner's property. When people who are fighting injure a pregnant woman so that there is a miscarriage and yet no further harm follows, the one responsible shall be fined, but the woman's husband demands paying as much as the judges determine. If any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, and stripe for stripe. When a slave owner strikes the eye of a male or female slave, destroying it, the owner shall let the slave go, a free person to compensate for the eye. If the owner knocks out a tooth of a male or female slave, the slave shall be let go, a free person, to compensate for the tooth. When an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall not be liable. If the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past, and its owner has been warned but has not restrained it, and it kills a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and its owner also shall be put to death. If a ransom is imposed on the owner, then the owner shall pay whatever is imposed for the redemption of the victim's life. If it gores a boy or a girl, the owner shall be dealt with according to this same rule. If the ox gores a ma male or female slave, the owner shall pay to the slave owner 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. If someone leaves a pit open, or digs a pit, and does not cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit shall make restitution, giving money to its owner, but keeping the dead animal. If someone's ox hurts the ox of another so that it dies, then they shall sell the life, the live ox, and divide the price of it, and the dead animal they shall also divide. But, it w but if it was known that the ox was accustomed to gore in the past and its owner has not restrained it, the owner shall restore ox for ox, but keep the dead animal. When someone steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, the thief shall pay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. The thief shall make restitution, but if unable to do so, shall be sold for the theft. If a thief is found breaking in and is beaten to death, no blood guilt is incurred. But if it happens after sunrise, blood guilt is incurred. When the animal, whether ox or donkey or sheep, is found alive in the thief's possession, the thief shall pay double. When someone causes a field or vineyard to be grazed over, or lets livestock loose to graze in someone else's field, restitution shall be made from the best in the owner's field or vineyard. When fire breaks out and catches in thorns so that the stacked grain or the standing grain for the, of, or the field is consumed, the one who started the fire shall make full restitution. When someone delivers to a neighbor money or goods for safekeeping and they are stolen from the neighbor's house, then the thief, if caught, shall pay double. If the thief is not caught, the owner of the house shall be brought before God to determine whether or not the owner had laid hands on the neighbor's goods. In any case of disputed ownership involving ox, donkey, sheep, clothing, or any other loss of which one party says, this is mine, the case of both parties shall come before God. The one whom God condemns shall pay double to the other. When someone delivers to another a donkey, ox, sheep, or any other animal for safekeeping, and it dies or is injured or is carried off without anyone else seeing it, 
An oath before the Lord shall decide between the two of them that the one has not laid hands on the property of the other. The owner shall accept the oath, and no restitution shall be made. But if it was stolen, restitution shall be made to its owner. If it was mangled by beasts, let it be brought as evidence. Restitution shall not be made for the mangled remains. When someone borrows an animal from another and it is injured or dies, the owner not being present, full restitution shall be made. If the owner was present, there shall be no restitution. If it was hired, only the hiring fee is due. When a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged to be married and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. But if her father refuses to give her to him, he shall pay an amount equal to the bride price for virgins. You shall not permit a female sorcerer to live. Whoever lies with an animal shall be put to death. Whoever sacrifices to any god, other than that the Lord alone shall be devoted to destruction. You shall not wrong or oppress a resident alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. You shall not abuse an, uh, any widow or orphan. If you do abuse them, when they cry out to me, I will surely heed their cry. My wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall become widows and your children orphans. If you lend money to my people, to the people poor among you, you shall not deal with them as a creditor. You shall not exact interest from them. If you take your neighbor's cloak in pawn, you shall restore it before the sun goes down. For it may be your neighbor's only clothing to use as a cover. In what else shall that person sleep? And if your neighbor cries out to me, I will listen, for I am compassionate. You shall not revile God or curse a leader of your people. You shall not delay to make offerings from the fullness of your harvest and from the outflow of your presses. The firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. You shall do the same with your oxen and with your sheep. Seven days it shall remain with its mother. On the eighth day you shall give it to me. You shall be people consecrated to me. Therefore you shall not eat any meat that is mangled by beasts in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. You shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with the wicked to act as a malicious witness. You shall not follow a majority in wrongdoing. When you bear witness in a lawsuit, you shall not side with the majority so as to pervert justice, nor shall you be partial to the poor in a lawsuit. When you come upon your enemy's ox or donkey going astray, you shall bring it back. When you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden, and you would not, and you would hold back from setting it free, you must help to set it free. You shall not pervert the justice due to your poor in their lawsuits. Keep far from a false charge, and do not kill the innocent and those in the right, for I will not acquit the guilty. You shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the officials and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. You shall not oppress a resident alien. You know the heart of an alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. For six years you shall sow your land and gather in its yield. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, so that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the wild animals may eat. You shall do the same with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. Six days you shall do work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, so that your ox and your donkey may have relief, and your home-born slave and your resident alien may be refreshed. Be attentive to all that I have said to you. Do not invoke the names of other gods, and do not let them be heard on your lips." Three times in a year you shall hold a festival for me. You shall observe the festival of unleavened bread, as I commanded you. You shall eat unleavened bread for seven days at the appointed time in the month of Abib, for in it you came out of Egypt. No one shall appear before me empty-handed. You shall observe the festival of harvest, or the festival of fruits, of your labor, of what you sow in the field. You shall observe the festival of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in from the field the fruit of your labor. Three times in the year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened, or let the fat of my festival remain until the morning. The choicest of your first fruits of your ground you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. So, that's our section. <laughs> that was a long section. Um, and it's a lot. A lot of laws. Um, but... There's a reason we're putting all of these together today. Um, actually, a couple of reasons we're putting all these together today. So, uh, first of all, before we get into it, does anyone have any questions, comments, concerns, anything that anybody wants to point out? Are there any uh, comments that people want to make? Any things that, that stuck out to you that you want to make comment on? Are there any questions that you want to ask about the passage specifically? 
Um, anything that concerns you about the passage? I'm sure there's a couple things in here that could come up as quite concerning to quite a few people. Um, I have answers for some of them that are probably going to be the concerning ones. I don't know if I have answers for all of the questions that people might have for this passage because it's a long one and there's a lot, a lot, a lot of individual laws with a lot of cultural background behind them, but uh, they're still important to us today and I will get into that um, in just a second here. Um, but yeah, any questions, comments, concerns, anything that you guys want to talk about? Um, before that, uh, while I'm waiting for those questions, comments, and every everything to come into the chat, while I'm waiting on all of those, let me give a, l a little bit of feedback as to where we are right now. Sorry, let me grab a drink. <laughs> so, in the book of Exodus, God has freed the Israelites from slavery under Pharaoh's hands, right? Uh, Jacob and his family came into Egypt um, during a time of famine. Uh, over many, many generations, the Israelites have multiplied into a greater number. Uh, Jacob's descendants, that being, uh, Jacob's descendants over this time period have become to be known as the Israelites. Um, this being because Jacob was renamed to Israel by God. So even though we call him Jacob, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob was renamed to Israel in the same way that Abram was renamed into Abraham, right? So um, Jacob gets named into Israel, and then Israel and his 12 sons go into Egypt, and then they, gen they multiply over generations, and they become known as the Israelites because they're the sons of Israel. Um, Pharaoh oppresses them and puts them into slavery. God frees them. And now that the Israelites have been freed from their slavery, Moses has been guiding them through the wilderness um, under God's directive. And now they have made it to Mount Sinai, which of course is famous for having the Ten Commandments. Um, God says that he wants to enter into covenant or contract with the Israelites. And he says to them, essentially, uh, if you obey my voice and my commands, then I will make you my holy people on this earth and I will bless you and keep you and make you a great nation and give you this promised land and all of this stuff, right? Um, so we saw that part of the covenant up here just before the Ten Commandments. Uh, so chapter 19, uh, the Israelites reach Mount Sinai and then God says that the people have to be consecrated. They have to be uh, purified before they're allowed to uh, be in the presence of God at the mountain. Uh, God comes down upon the mountain and he gives the Ten Commandments, right? The Ten Commandments, the super famous things, right? And these Ten Commandments are the uh, command that God is asking the Israelites to obey if they are to be his holy people on this earth, right? And that's why we as Christians today still follow the Ten Commandments because we believe that these Ten Commandments are God's word to all of us, not just the Israelites, as to what it means to constitute a holy people, right? And we as the church, we have been called by God to be God's new holy people on this earth, right? And if we are going to be the holy people, the set-apart nation that God wants us to be, then we have to, you know, follow God's command. And we believe that these Ten Commandments are one of the ways that God calls us to be that, right? And we talked about that last week when we went through the Ten Commandments. Um, we said... Uh, in the New Testament, whenever Jesus is talking to the disciples and the apostles who will found the church, uh, he tells to them that all you have to do is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And if you follow those two commands, then you can, then you can do no wrong, right? All the law and the prophets, they hang upon those two commands. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right? And essentially, we determined that those two commands are essentially a simplification of the Ten Commandments. Right? The first four commandments of the Ten Commandments have to deal with telling us as humans how we can love God. Right? And how can we love God? Well, we have no other gods beside our God. Right? No other false idols, no other false gods that we worship. Right? So we have no other gods before, before our God. Uh, we make no, no other idols before ourselves, whether they are physical idols that we are worshiping or whether they are other people that we worship or other things. Um, we talked more about that last week because really anything can be an idol if you put it before God. You know, money can be an idol. 
uh, body can be an idol, another person can be an idol, your work can be an idol, anything can be an idol, right? So have no other gods before God, do not make for you before yourself any idols, uh, don't use the Lord's name in vain, uh, and then also keep the Sabbath day and make it holy. Uh, so this is a day where you're supposed to rest, um, that God has commanded as uh God has commanded essentially that we as humans need to rest on the seventh day. Uh, so those four commands have to do with how we can love God. The other six have to do with how we can love our neighbor, right? So honor your father and mother. Do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And do not covet, right? Don't do those six things. You'll probably be fine, right? Um, but upon hearing the Ten Commandments, the people get scared, right? And they kind of back off. So what's the response, right? When the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and they trembled and stood at a distance. And they said to Moses, how about you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has only come to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. Then the people stood at a distance while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Right? So essentially the Israelites responded to God's message, God's command, by backing away from it because they were too scared. Right? And the idea is what human shouldn't be. Right? What human shouldn't be scared of this command that God has put upon us. Right? This is not a command just for one person, but for the whole nation. God expects the whole nation to follow these 10 commands. And that's a scary thought. That's a scary thought to make sure that every person in the nation is following these 10 commands, right? And the people are scared of that. They back away. Um, and because of that, it appears that God is going to have to expand upon this, right? God is going to have to expand upon the original 10 commands and make it more specific. What are we talking about? Oh, hey, Nate, how's it going? How's it going? You came in at a really good time. So we just read through the passage um, and we are going back into the background, right, before this passage. So um, essentially last week we talked about the Ten Commandments and how that is essentially, you know, God's original command to the Israelites to follow these ten things to be his holy people. Uh, but then at the end of the Ten Commandments, the people react with fear and they back away. And because of that, um, we get into our section for today, which is a bunch of expanded law, right? And before going further into this, right, the idea is th these sections of law, like this large section of law, is essentially expanding upon the Ten Commandments to make more specific rules for how the Israelites can follow the Ten Commandments, right? We see that, um, right, in, in a lot of things, right? So, wh how, wh like, what constitutes as murder versus, say, capital punishment, right? So, we have this section here, and this, this expands upon the one commandment to not, to not murder, right? And then we also have, um, down here, laws concerning property, right? One of the other commandments was do not steal. Well, how do we handle when somebody does steal? How do we handle... Um, if something does not believe to have been stolen, um, things like that, right? And restitution, you know, for things that have been stolen or things that have been broken, uh, more social and religious laws uh, having to do with parents and stuff like that. And then um, down here, we have more rules specifically regarding the Sabbath, right? So essentially, these laws here are expanding upon the Ten Commandments and um, giving more specifics as to how the Israelite people can follow the Ten Commandments, um, while also giving uh, essentially subsidiary rules for what to do if one of the commands is broken, right? Because the original Ten Commandments is just saying, you know, don't do this, right? Like, for example, do not murder, Right? But then this further law that we're getting into is going to talk about rules for what to do if someone does commit murder. Right? How does the Israelite civilization handle whenever somebody does break that command and commits a murder? How do the people handle that? Right? So the Ten Commandments is essentially the basic law that God gives to the Israelites in order to show how humanity 
can be a holy and set apart people, which, like I said, is exactly why we follow the Ten Commandments as Christians, right? Because a lot of Christians will look back on the Old Testament and they'll say, you know, that's old stuff for a different people and it's all cultural and we only have to follow the New Testament stuff, right? But as a Christian, right, we also believe that our God is unchanging. You know, he's all good. He's um, all perfect. He's an amazing judge. Like, he's the perfect judge. Um, and we also believe that all of the Bible is God's word, not just the New Testament, right? So as Christians, we have to read this with a contextual lens, and we have to determine what of this applies to us today and what does not. And the Ten Commandments is a clear one that, that applies to us today because Jesus himself expands upon the Ten Commandments and speaks on that by expanding upon how we should follow the Ten Commandments today. Um, and even clearer, right, as we have determined, whenever the people respond in the way that they do, um, the Israelites get further specific law on how they can follow the Ten Commandments in their culture. So does that mean these laws mean nothing to us today? And to that, I would also say no. Some of this clearly does not apply to us today, such as the law concerning slaves, right? We don't have slaves today. You know, that's not a thing we have, right? The Israelites had slaves because, you know, every culture back then had slaves, right? And this law concerning slaves was essentially a way of them being able to handle a broken part of human civilization and make it a lot better, right? Um, but that being said, just because law concerning slaves would not apply to us today because we don't have slaves, that doesn't mean that we cannot glean truth from these claims. There are things in that we have there are things in these claims about the law that have universal truths for all people, whether the specific law applies to us or not. And we can get into that a lot as we go through the different sections, right? Like Sabbath, for instance, we believe that we should practice Sabbath as Christians, right? So that's one example of this law that does apply to us. Altus, good to see you too. Oh, we are getting some people tonight. I was a little worried with how late we were starting, but Altus, it's good to see you, man. Now we just have children. What does that mean? <laughs> it's good to see you, Altus. I'm glad you're here. Got here at a good time. So, First of all, we have the section concerning uh, the law on the altar. So this is the first section of our longer law section, the law concerning the altar, right? Children to manage the farm. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> oh my. Are we getting into, like, some, some Power World stuff like we were just playing last night? Put, the, put them to work? <laughs> So we got, we got this first section concerning the altar, right? And initially, uh, our gut reaction would be to say, well, we don't make sacrifices today. We don't make altars and stuff like that. But, um, you know, there are some things that we can glean from this section as well, right? Um, the children crave the mines. That's why they play Minecraft. Dude, so Dietrich, I don't know if you, I mean, Altus, you might know Dietrich. He, he joins us on stream every once in a while. He just made that joke the other day. <laughs> we were playing Minecraft and he said that exact same joke. He was like, let the children play in the mines, you know? They, that's why they play Minecraft. They yearn. They yearn for the mines. Do you actively practice Sabbath right now once a week? Yes. So, um, I actively practice Sabbath. I cannot practice Sabbath at, I mean, on Sunday, right? Because we as Christians practice uh, Sabbath on Sunday. Uh, however, you know, if you're a pastor, you can't really do Sabbath on Sunday because you're working all day Sunday, right? So typically the thing that pastors do or people that work in a church as, you know, an executive pastor or whatever, uh, typically they will take their Sabbath on like a Saturday or something like that. Uh, so that's what I actively do because I help work in uh, there's a church that I'm doing an internship at, uh, so I have to work on Sundays. Um, I'm, I'm taking a short break from that right now, uh, but I will. I have been doing my internship there, and technically I'm still doing my internship there. I'm just going to pick it back up in a, a month or so. Um, but that being said, um, I do actively practice Sabbath. I just don't do it on Sunday. I do it on Saturday because a lot of, uh, because of the conflict with pastors having to work on Sunday. 
uh, being able to take a Sabbath on Sunday isn't really practical. Uh, so that it's a long way of answering that. I do practice Sabbath, uh, but I do it on Saturday because I work in a church on Sunday. Um, oh gosh, do you play golf? Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I mini golf every once in a while. Uh, not all that often. Why do you play golf? Nate, uh, what streak reached? Oh my gosh, a 20 stream streak. Nate, that's crazy. I didn't even know that was a thing you could get. A 20 stream streak? That's wild. I don't, but I'm interested in it. You'll have to give me some pointers sometime. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'd love to do that. Um, I know you're reading that book. Um, I'm guessing that's probably what gave you a little bit of inclination to ask that question. The I'll shout out the book. It's called The Elimination of Hurry. Nate's been reading through it. I have it on my list of books that I want to read. Um, but I'm guessing that's probably where you've been getting some ideas about that. But I, I will say it took me a while. Um, I wasn't very good at taking Sabbath for a lot of my life. But I you know, realized uh, shortly into my undergrad that I probably should actively practice it. So I got into a pretty good habit pretty quickly. Um, obviously, there's some things that come up every once in a while. Um, like last semester, for instance, I had a... a uh, an intensive class that I had to take uh, because of my course load. I couldn't really not take it. And it had three Saturdays last semester that I had to go into a class. Um, so uh, that kind of got in the way. Um, but I, you know, other than things that I absolutely have no control of, I, I do. Golf is a great game. Out in nature being active, healthy competition with friends. I mean, golf is a great game. I've heard golf is like the perfect game to play if you're looking to hire someone because you get to see the character of someone. That's a long story for another time. That was a whole uh, podcast I was listening to, which is pretty cool. Exodus 20 already. Yes, we are going at it. Uh, like we're doing one to two chapters at a time. Well, actually, today we're doing like two and a half chapters, so we're kind of going at it. I've also noticed many of the top golfers in the world are devout Christians. We're all in a... Huh, I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Well, anyways, sorry, getting sidetracked a little bit. <laughs> Let me get back into it. So we have the law concerning the altar, right? So initially, our reaction as Christians is to say, uh, this isn't going to apply to us right off the bat. Let's just skip it and move on to the law concerning slaves. Oh, wait, we don't have slaves either. So let's go on to the law concerning violence. Well, no, no, there's still truth we can glean from this, right? We still believe this is God's work, right? Um, so obviously, we don't make sacrifices today as Christians because we believe via the New Testament, via the Gospels, via the book of Hebrews, um, that Christ has re has become the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, and currently, uh, this is expanded upon in the theology of the book of Hebrews, we believe that Christ is the one that is continually uh, interceding for us on behalf of the Father in heaven as our living priest. Um, so essentially in the Old Testament covenant, right, you brought your sacrifices before the priests and the priests would sacrifice them. And then those sacrifices would be the atonement for your sins before God uh, and you would be forgiven of them. Uh, but uh, via the New Testament, we believe uh, Christ came and died for our sins. And now he is the mediator. He is currently the priest in heaven before God himself, right? It is no longer a human priest. Uh, going before God with a with a animal sacrifice, it is now Christ in heaven as the priest and the sacrifice, right? The book of Hebrews expands on the idea that Christ is not only the priest interceding before God for us, but also that he is the sacrifice himself, right? His sacrifice on the cross. Um, so the belief is that Christ now does that. I've also noticed, uh, well, repentance atoned, but the sacrifice was the physical act required to make amends. No repentance equals no atonement. Well, yes, I mean, obviously I'm simplifying it. Um, what I was kind of saying there essentially was the parallel between the Old Testament, uh, the idea of the priest and the sacrifice being replaced by Christ as the new priest and sacrifice. Uh, obviously, yes, as Altus says, there is the act of repentance that is involved in that process. Um, I was just saying about how uh, there's no longer the need for a human priest or an animal sacrifice because Christ has become the sacrifice and the priest. Uh, so yes, sorry, there is the, the need for repentance as well. Um, but instead of it being a human priest and an animal sacrifice, it's now Christ who replaces both. Uh, yes, sorry, th that, that is also part of it as well. 
I know sacrifice for unintentional sins or blasphemy of God, which has no forget. God go through the fire and refined. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say intentional, intentional. Yes, uh, and the and the Old Testament will get into the difference between the two. Uh, that's not in this section for today. I'll save the difference between unintentional and intentional sin for a later section, because um, we that's not really in this section for today. But there is the difference between unintentional and intentional sin that the Old Testament will get into at a certain point. Um, but that being said, uh, even though we currently do not have animal sacrifices and altars and stuff like that, there are still things in here that are good to know, right? For instance, it re-expands on the commandment in the Ten Commands, um, you shall not make any gods of silver alongside me, nor shall you make for yourselves gods of gold, right? Um, so this is expanding upon the earlier commandment. Uh, you shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make for yourself an idol, right? And even though you can technically make an idol out of anything, right? You can make an idol out of money. You can make an idol out of another person. You can make an idol out of anything, right? You can make a god of really anything also. The idea is, for the ancient cultures, typically the, one, the thing that they would make into gods is literal idols as we would picture it in our head like a, a statue a little thing uh, and it would be made out of gold or silver right so the law expands on this for the israelites by claiming yes this means that you cannot make for yourself an image you know a silver gold idol image and about this is this is this would have actually been the height of them right like we actually picture you know these massive statues and idols and like whenever we picture the golden calf that aaron made uh, late, we haven't gotten there yet. This is later on in, you know, this book. But there's going to be the incident where Aaron makes a golden calf for the Israelites, right? And we picture that as, like, this massive desk-sized thing. In reality, the, the golden calf was probably, like, this big. <laughs> Obviously, we don't know that for sure. But it was probably pretty small. Because a lot of the idols that they made back then were pretty small things. Uh, they didn't really make them super big um, or anything like that. Uh, but that's to say, you know, they back then would typically make their idols out of gold or silver, uh, and they would worship those. Uh, but, you know, obviously we can make anything to an idol. We can make anything into a god. Um, so this is obviously something that we should listen to today, right? You need make for me only an altar on earth and sacrifice on it, your burnt offerings and your offerings of well-being, your sheep and your oxen, in every place where I may cause my name to be remembered. I will come to you and bless you. But if you make for me an altar of stone, do not build it of hone stones. Right, so this is the stuff, you know, the Israelites and the Jews had to follow this specific law with the altars and the animals. We believe that, you know, this type of priest and sacrifice system is is necessary, but that Christ is now the priest and the animal sacrificing uh, on our behalf and interceding before the Father on our behalf. So this is no longer something that we as humans do Right? This is not something that we as Christians do, even though this is something that the Israelites and the Jews did, because we believe that Christ has become that. Right, So that's to say, even though we don't physically sacrifice animals and make physical altars, that isn't to say that this isn't important information for us as Christians. Because as the book of Hebrews in the New Testament makes clear, the theology surrounding sacrifices and atonement for sin are still important concepts for us as Christians. Right? We have to understand the Levitical priestly sacrificial system in order to understand the importance of Christ's atoning sin, Christ's atoning sacrifice for our sins. If we didn't have this law surrounding the altars and sacrifices, then we wouldn't understand what that atonement means in the New Testament. Right? So that's to say this stuff is important um, just to us in a little bit of a different way. Um, did I send you the write-up on the four priesthoods? I don't remember that one. You might have sent that one to me, but I don't remember that one. I think the most recent one you sent me was the Jesus and Pharisees one. So that's the law concerning the altar. Now we have the law concerning slaves, right? And once again, our first reaction is probably going to say, well, we don't have slaves, so let's pass over it. But no, I, I want to actually dissect what this has to say about slaves, because I think, first of all, it's going to reveal some interesting insight about how uh, God treats people. And also, I think it's going to reveal some interesting insight into how countercultural the Israelites were, right? So it starts off, when you buy a male Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, but in the seventh, he shall go a free person without debt. 
right off the bat, this is super countercultural. Like, when the ancient peoples owned a slave, that, like, that was it. There weren't really laws concerning slaves until about the Roman Empire. So the fact that there's even a law like this first law, like just the first sentence of this, just the first sentence of this, this is already super countercultural to every culture back then. There were not really laws concerning slaves until the Roman Empire. So just the, just the idea that a slave could go free after six years without debt and become a free person was already super countercultural to the time, right? So that's just the first line, right? Then, if he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then he, he, his wife shall go with him, right? So here's even more rights for the slave, right? The idea is, you know, if the slave has a wife, wife goes with him, right? If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters and he shall go out alone, but if the slave declares, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out a free person. Then his master shall bring him before God. He shall be brought to the door of the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an owl, and he shall serve him for life. Right? So the idea then is, um, so the master keeps the wife and the sons and daughters because back then the idea was, uh, so think about back to the Abraham and Hagar situation back in Genesis, right? The Hagar was one of Abraham and Sarah's slaves. Uh, and the children that Hagar bore were technically Abraham's, right? So that's to say this was in their system. They believed um, the wife and the sons and daughters were still the masters if the wife was already of the master, right? Like Hagar. But that's to say the slave could the slave could decide to stay with the master, wife, and children and not go out free, right? So the idea, so, so that brings up a good question, right? The good question here is, why would a slave want to stay a slave? Why in the world would a slave choose to be a slave? Well, here's something that's really important to know. We here in America... Right. I'm, assu I'm assuming most people in this chat are from America. I know, you know, Nate's here and Cole's here and, and stuff like that, right? I'm from America as well. In the American context, we have a different view of slavery than how the ancients actually did slavery. That's not, th that's not me justifying slavery, but that is to say slavery was a lot different back then than how we as Americans perceive slavery because our slavery was a lot different. So... In ancient times, well, not in every culture, not in every culture, but in the Hebrew culture, a person would sell themselves into slavery to pay off debt, right? It was a chosen thing, right? It was a chosen thing to become a slave in a lot of instances, right? A lot, a lot of instances, it was a chosen thing to be a slave. Think of it like debtor's prison, right? If you're in a lot of debt, you go to prison because you're in debt. Right? If a person had a lot of debt, they could choose to become a slave to work off that money. Right? We've already seen an instance of this in the Bible. Right? Remember Jacob? Jacob chose to put himself into indentured slavery to Laban so that he could marry Laban's daughter. Right? He worked for Laban for seven years. Well, 14 years. He worked for Laban for 14 years so that he could get Laban's daughter's wife. Right? That was the same concept. Jacob chose to become essentially a slave of um, Jacob chose to become a slave of Laban to, to earn his to get his daughter, right? In the same way a person in the Hebrew culture could sell themselves into slavery to pay off a debt. Right? It was a chosen thing. It wasn't really a forced thing. That isn't to say that all slavery wasn't forced, because it was possible that people of other nations could be taken in as slaves, right? Like Hagar was an Egyptian slave that was taken in. So that's why the rest of these laws are here, right? The idea is then a person can sell themselves into slavery to pay off a debt. Then, you know, after six years, they can go free. But if they want to stay with the master and the wife and the children, they can choose to stay there. Right? So this is an incredible amount of rights 
for a slave, right? For, for a male slave here, this is a lot of rights that are given to the slave. Um, let me get caught up. It's a good to know about sacrifices since according to Ezekiel, they will return with the Messianic era. Oh, you're going to have to send me that one, Altus. I'd love to read that one. And the slave has to be given enough to start a new life. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't, I think that's listed somewhere else. I know it's not here specifically, but yeah, like the slave has to be given enough to start a new life, right? So it's super countercultural. It's super invested in the people itself. And I wasn't going to bring this up so soon, but a recurring theme among this whole section, this whole three chapters of law that we're going over today, a common theme among all of it is this idea of essentially the sanctity of life, right? Like we have this section on slaves here, and then we have the sections on uh, the, the life of a person and the life of uh, like, like looking out for foreigners and looking out for orphans and widows and all that stuff. Like this whole section is looking out for the best of the marginalized in society and helping them out. Right, this is a whole section just on how to make slaves' lives better. Many people nowadays are essentially wage slaves. They don't have a realistic choice to opt out. I mean, that's a whole other conversation, right? That's a whole other conversation for another day, right? Like, we have, you know, people who are in, you know, infinite debt in our society and stuck working, you know, horrible jobs. And, you know, there's, there's wage slaves <laughs> really in our society today, too. That's a really good point as well. But the idea is, you know, there were no rights for slaves anywhere back in the ancient world when this was taking place. So the idea that the Hebrews had any laws at all surrounding slaves, not, not like let alone the fact that their laws were so helpful to the slaves is such like a good th and like like I said, remember, like I was saying, the slaves weren't like forced Right. Like we in America, we have this idea, you know, slaves are, you know, because that's how slavery worked in America. It, it wasn't something that slaves chose. You know, the, the, the slaves in America were forced into slavery. Right. But the Hebrew slaves, they chose the Hebrew chose the The Hebrews chose to put themselves into slavery to pay off debt. Right. And during their time in debt, they had all these rights that were given before them by the law. Right? It's a very, very different picture that we need to be viewing the Israelite slavery in compared to American slavery. Two completely different things. Not saying that either were great, right? But the idea is even in a broken world where slavery was a reality in every nation, the Israelites were so countercultural and so different in the way that they handled things. And I actually have an excerpt that I want to read here before we go any further. Uh, I've been saving this for this section. Uh, let me find the pictures I sent myself, if I can find them. Um, so this is from a thing that I read a little while ago, and it is commentary on this whole section of law, not just this slave section, but it speaks really well to this slave section, right? And I'm just going to read through it. Um, so, and I quote, some of the content of the laws in the chapter today might seem very foreign to us as modern readers. It is important to take ourselves back to the context these laws were written in, rather than projecting back from our current society onto the ancient Israelites. When we see it in this way, these laws are actually incredibly countercultural for the time. People would go into slavery to pay off their debts they owed. The idea that you would let your slave go after every seventh year was unheard of. This is connected to the Sabbath, one of the Ten Commandments we will come back to in, in a couple days. Continuing on here, uh, wait, is that the right? Sorry, I lost my spot. Here we go. Even those who accidentally killed someone would have mercy by providing places for them to go, and human life was seen as so sacred that an ox that killed a person would not even be eaten. Overall, this passage shows us that laws are sometimes needed but there is a higher way. If the Israelites had chosen an intimate relationship with God despite their fear, perhaps there would not have needed to be all this intricate and strange law that we read about. This is indicated by Jesus when he says all the law can be summed up by loving God and loving people. Right, so that goes back to what we were talking about last week in that 
um, the Ten Commandments is a is a is a is a particularization of the two laws that God that Jesus sets out in the New Testament to love God and to love neighbor. In the same way that this law is a particularization of the Ten Commandments to the to the particular Israelite people, um, and it's a law for a different people, it's a law for a broken ancient world, it's a law for a different time period in a different place. But that doesn't mean that there is not truth that is gleaned from it. And we see from these sections that there is a sanctity of life that is expressed in these chapters, right? Slaves are loved and cared for, and there's rights for them, and they are all chosen to be in slavery, right? These slaves choose to be in slavery or choose not to be in slavery, but when they do choose to go into slavery, they have rights that they have set aside for them. And we're going to see so many other sections today that deals with the sanctity of life that this law presents. There's one law divided into two, divided into five, divided into ten, divided into six hundred and thirteen. Exa like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying, right? The, the law that Jesus gives, love God and love neighbor, divided into the Ten Commandments, divided into all the law that we see here. Every law is connected to every law. Thus, if you fulfill a law, it's like fulfilling all laws. You break a law. And that's exactly what Paul talks about, right? If you've broken a law, you've broken all the law, right? And that's because, as Jesus says, all of the law and prophets hang on the command to love God and love neighbor. If you love God and love neighbor, you can do no wrong because all of the law hangs upon those two laws. So if you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself, you fulfill all the law. Right? This 613 laws is just a particularization showing us what it means to love God and to love neighbor. Right? So then we have law concerning... Uh, uh, female slaves, right? When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master who designated her for herself, then she he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he has dealt with unfairly with her, right? So here we see, right? Like, this is horrible. The dude wants to give her up. Like, he's dealt unfairly with her. It's literally said here. He has dealt unfairly with her if he tries to get rid of her after having taken her as his wife. Right? He shouldn't be allowed to do that. If he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her as a daughter. Right? So, you know, he, if, if he has taken her, if he's taken her as, as a slave, as a wife, then he's dealt unfairly with her, and now he must treat her as a daughter. And if he decides to take another wife besides the female slave, he shall not diminish the food, clothing, or metal rights of the first wife being the slave that he got, right? So he cannot just get rid of this female slave. He cannot just sell her away. He must treat her as a daughter. And also, he cannot diminish her rights, her food, any of that, if he decides to take on another wife. And if he does not do all of these three things for her, then she shall go free. Right? If, if the guy takes on a female slave and makes her his wife, he cannot just get rid of her. He must love her as a daughter, and he cannot just take on another wife and forget about his, his other wife, the slave that he got. He must keep give her the same rights. And if he refuses to give her the same rights as his new wife, then she goes free without debt, without payment of money. That's pretty countercultural. That is pretty, that is very, 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 very counter to the culture that this was written in. Very countercultural to every nation at that time. Also, thank you for reminding me to drink water. <laughs> I'm going to really need that whenever we get here in this section. We got a lot to go through. Thank you for that. So, now we get into the law concerning violence, right? And I want to go back after this first line. Whoever strikes a person mortally shall be put to death. That's weird. Doesn't the Ten Commandments say do not kill? Why is this dude being put to death if the Ten Commandments says do not kill? Well, like we talked about last week, do not kill is a pretty bad translation of the Hebrew. And modern day English translations have caught on to that. Uh, modern English translations have started to translate it as you shall not murder, right? And this little annotation here says or kill because the originals say do not kill. 
But let's think about this for a second. If this commandment is do not kill, then you cannot make animal sacrifices. The death penalty cannot be a thing. You cannot protect yourself from foreign invaders. You cannot do any of that. A better translation of the original Hebrew is you shall not murder. Because murder is very different than killing, right? Death penalty does not fall under murder. Which, as we can see here, the death penalty is going to be in the Israelite law. Right? Right here in the first line. Whoever strikes a person mortally shall be put to death. Right? If, I, if you kill someone in Israel, you are by law sentenced to be put to death by death penalty. But, there's, it goes further, if it was not premeditated but came about by an act of God, right? If it was an accident, if it wasn't premeditated that this person was going to kill the other person, if it was just an accident, then it will be appointed a place to which the killer may flee, right? If the person did not kill the other person on purpose, if it was an accident, then the person's family is probably going to be gunning to kill this guy. Even though it wasn't this guy's fault that the other guy died, even, if, even though it wasn't this guy's fault that the other guy died, it was an accident, you know, he is given a place to flee to so that there might be no harm that comes upon him. So that there might not be no friends or family that are trying to gun for him and take him out and get revenge. This person who is involved in this accidental killing is given a place to free to so that they can be safe. And it continues on again. But if someone willfully attacks and kills another by treachery, you shall take the killer from my altar for persecution. Right? So this is, you know, whoever strikes a person mortally shall be put to death. If it was an accident, the person will be given a place to flee to so that they might not have any harm come to them. But if the person willfully attacks and kills another person, they shall be taken to the altar to have the death penalty brought upon them. Then, further, whoever strikes father or mother shall be put to death. Simple enough. You strike your father or mother, put to death. You know, same thing, you know, if you willfully kill another person, put, get, you give them the death penalty. Whoever kidnaps a person, whether that person has been sold or is still in possession, shall be put to death. Right? So this is going back to the slavery thing. You can't just take a person and make them your property. The person has to willingly sell themselves into slavery to pay off a debt. Right? Because in the Hebrew culture, slaves are meant to be willfully slaves. Right? That's where this goes counter to the American culture. Right? We have the idea in America that slaves were, because that's how we did it in America. Right? In America, slavery was absolutely, all slavery is disgusting. Right? But in America, it was particularly disgusting. In the Hebrew culture, it was so different because all the slaves chose to put themselves into slavery. The, the, the Hebrews chose to put themselves into slavery to pay off debt, right? You cannot just take a person. It's in the law. You can't just take a person, and make them your slave or kidnap them because if you do, you're going to be put to death. <laughs> Further, whoever curses father or mother shall be put to death. We should expand upon cursing. Cursing is not simply just like F you. <laughs> Right in a, here in our society today, we we think of like cursing as like a cuss word. Cursing is like a lot worse to them. This is like th think of kind of I don't I don't really know how to compare it to us today. It's very different. We don't really have something like this today. Um, kind of like. Maybe death threats is a good modern example. It's kind of hard to give a modern analogy to what cursing me meant to them back then. Um, it, it was kind of like premeditated threatening. It, it wasn't like a simple curse. It was, it was more kind of like, I'm going to kill you. Or this is going to happen to you, and this is how it's going to happen to you. It was, it was, it was like really premeditated, kind of cursing, like with your whole being. You know, hate this person, and you're going to do something horrible to them, or someone else is going to do something horrible to them, kind of a deal. Like the cursing was a lot different 
to them than it was for like us. It, it's kind of hard to give like a modern analogy, but maybe that gets the point across. I mean, if there's like more questions about it, maybe I can like try to get more analogies, but it's, we don't really have something like that today. Um, but it's not simply like cuss word. This is, this is like a lot more like threat, like pretty bad. That should be obvious. It's only bad faith interpretations that try to twist the meaning of kill. How can you oppose abortion but think you have a mass murderer should be executed? How can you oppose abortion but think? Wait, sorry. I'm misunderstanding. I, I got to read through that. I'm, I might be misunderstanding it. How can you twist the meaning of kill? How can you oppose abortion but you think a mass murderer should be executed? Wait, sorry. I'm trying to follow the line of thought. So is this saying, is this saying abortion is bad? Abortion is not bad? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm like, that's in quotation marks. Sorry, I'm just having problem following, I, I'm having a little bit of problem following the argument. Sorry, my brain's a little bit fuzzy. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. Didn't space it properly. Um, yeah, so, so kill, right? Kill being different in this, right? It's not kill, it's murder right murder being different than kill how can you oppose abortion Mass murder should be executed so this is so what you're saying is um you're saying just as a mass murder should be executed someone who you know commits abortion is the same thing right because you're killing baby killing mass murder right i'm assuming Sorry, trying to follow the argument. And I, I, my, my brain's not putting it together for some reason. <laughs> no, that this is common argument used against Christian. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I'm following. I'm following. Sorry. Sorry, it took me a little bit to figure out what you were saying, but I get it now. The whole thing's in quotations. I thought you were saying just the kill was in quotation. I'm following now. Yeah. No, I completely agree. That's definitely an argument that's used against Christians, which is a little bit ridiculous in my mind. But, yo, Zev, how's it going, man? Good time for you to stop in, Zev. We got a popping night going off here. <laughs> like, how can you be pro-life for the unborn but not pro-life for... Well, yeah, I mean, like, it's it's a whole thing, right? And this is why we as Christians would, would argue for the sanctity of life. Right, because this whole section on the law, as we just talked about, is is arguing for the sanctity of life. This law concerning violence is arguing for the sanctity of life. Right, you should not kill another person. That's horrible. Right, and then in the slave section, right, the slave section, it's arguing for the sanctity of all life and showing like, yeah, you know, like you have slaves in your society who willingly sell themselves into slavery to pay off debt, but you cannot just take a person and make them your slave. Like the slaves have to be willing to put themselves into slavery. You cannot just take a person and make them a slave. But if someone does decide to sell them into slavery to pay off a debt, if someone willingly puts themselves into slavery, you have all of these laws to back up them and give them rights that you must abide by. You must give the people who sell themselves into slavery specific rights. And we have all these other sections that we're gonna get into regarding orphans and uh, widows and foreigners, and it's going to all be about the sanctity of life. And this is why we as Christians would argue for as, as pro-life, because as Christians, we argue for pro-life because we believe in the sanctity of all life, regardless of what life it is. And if someone accidentally kills someone, you don't demand flesh for flesh. You, you let them go to a new city and live there until the current high priest dies. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like, there shouldn't be any unnecessary killing by any means, right? Like, and the, the law here is very fair whenever it comes to this kind of stuff. If it's an accident, if somebody kills someone on accident, they're allowed to go to a different town and stay there. It is, the person is only given the death penalty if they willingly, premeditatively kill someone, right? If they, by premeditation, by willfully killing someone, then they're given the death penalty. But if it's an accident, they're given a, w a place to go. Oh, exactly. Zev, trust me. We <laughs> it does, That's exactly what we were talking about before you came in. That's exactly what we were talking about, right? Like, our ver like we in America view slavery very differently than slavery actually was back then, 
right? In the Hebrew culture specifically, it was very different. The Hebrews chose to sell themselves into slavery, right? And as we said, you know, whoever kidnaps a person, whether that person is sold or being sold in possession, shall be put to death. Like, you cannot just take a person. You can't just take a person and make them your slave. The person has to sell themselves into slavery. They have to willingly, will, willfully put themselves into slavery to be a slave. You can't just take people and make them slaves, right? It was very different than how it was here in America. Um, so, so continuing on here, when individual curls... When individuals quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or a fist that the injured party, though not dead, is confined to bed, so, you know, paralyzed, coma, stuff like that, but recovers and walks around outside the help of a staff, then the assailant shall be free of liability except to pay for the loss of time and to arrange for full recovery. So, if you were responsible for paralyzing someone you know, crippling them, whatever, in an argument, you are not liable, you're not going to be given the death penalty, anything like that, but you must pay for the time that they lost at work, right? So essentially, like, if this person was away from work for three months and they weren't allowed to make any money, you have to pay for a three months wage, and also, you have to arrange for their full recovery. I mean, I'm just saying, this law, though not for us today, has a lot of truth that we can apply to today, right? Like this altar section, for instance, you know? This altar section, we don't have to make sacrifices anymore because Christ, and, you know, he's our priest and our sacrifice, all that good stuff. But there's a lot of good stuff here. You know, like we need this theology for our Christian, we need this atoning theology of the Levitical priests to understand what Christ's sacrifice meant for us back then. And this law concerning slaves, as well, like we don't have slaves today, but there's a lot of truth in here about the sanctity of life and how to treat people, right? And in here in the violence section, even though here in America we have different laws surrounding, you know, murder and stuff like that, it does not mean that even though our laws here in America are different, that there's not so much truth in here about the sanctity of life and how we should treat, uh, uh, trespass, not trespasses, um, what's uh, transgressions against other people. I'm going to message you later. I watched a debate the other day I want to ask you about. Yeah, I mean, feel free to message me. I'll answer it whenever, whenever you know, I'm not ranting here for a couple hours on stream about the Bible. <laughs> um, so, um, continuing on here, one second. So... Where when a slave owner strikes a male or female slave with a rod and the slave dies immediately, the owner shall be punished. But if the slave survives a day or two, there's no punishment for the slave is the owner's property, right? So I, I, I've been having a little bit of trouble. I couldn't find really too many comments or commentaries that talked about this. I feel like this can mean one of two things. What I understand this passage to be saying is, and maybe I'm wrong about this. Like I said, I, I didn't have time to like dissect every single one of these laws this week. I apologize about that. You know, there's a lot of individual laws here. This is one that I wanted to look into a little bit more. Um, my understanding of this one off the top of my head is, um, the idea is, if a slave owner strikes the slave and they die, the owner shall be punished. But if the slave survives after a day or two, there's no punishment. Right? So the idea is, uh, so I, I think, I think this is not saying if they die after a day or two. I think this is saying if they survive after a day or two. Right? I think that's what this is saying. I think that's what this is saying. Right? The idea is, if the slave dies, then the owner's punished. But if it looks like they're gonna die, but actually they make a recovery and they survive after a day or two, then they shall not be punished. So I think, I think what this is saying, if the slave dies, then the owner's punished. But if the slave survives, then there's no punishment. I think that's what, this is one I would want to look more into because the wording's weird on it. The wording's a little weird on it. So I would want to look into this one a little bit more. I wasn't able to do too much research on this one. But anyways, which speaking of the abortion thing, this is one of the arguments that th this is actually a passage that is used for the pro-life argument in the Christian world because this actually talks about 
pregnant women and miscarriages and the sanctity of life in them, right? So going back to the abortion thing, this is actually a verse that argues for pro-life. When people who are fighting injure a pregnant woman so that there is a miscarriage, and yet no further harm follows, the one responsible shall be fined with the hu hu woman's husband demands, paying as much as the judges determine. If any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, to eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. This is actually one that fights for the sanctity of life because this is saying, if the woman has a miscarriage, that's a horrible thing. And you need to, like, pay them back for that. Right? You need to, like, compensate them for the loss of that child. I always read it as an intention thing. Then if he immediately died, then obviously the owner meant to kill him. But if he lingers for a bit and dies, then the intent wasn't... Oh, that's an interesting... So going back to this one, Zev's talking about this verse, this, the last section we were just on. So you're saying the idea is if the slave dies immediately, then there was an intent to kill the slave. Thus, the owner is liable. But if the slave survives a day or two, then it was an accident. Therefore, the owner's not liable. That's a really interesting way to interpret that one as well. That's I actually really like that too. I mean, that goes back to up here, right? Um, in this section, if it's an accident, it's not the fault of the person. But if it's on purpose, then it's the fault of the person, right? And that would be the same thing down here. If it was premeditated, if it was on purpose to kill the slave, then it's the uh, the slave's fault. But if it was not for the intent of killing the slave, it's not the owner's fault. I mean, that makes sense. I, I, that, make, that makes sense as an answer, too. But yeah, so this is, this is just one of many passages in the Bible that I think can be used to argue for pro-life, right? Like, this is, this is saying, you know, it's a tragedy to lose a child in the womb, right? And there should be, you know, there should be compensation for that. And you shall give life for life. <laughs> and then finally in the violent section, when a slave owner strikes the eye of a male or female slave destroying it, the owner shall let the slave go, a free person to compensate for the eye. Or if the owner knocks out at the tooth of a male or female slave, the slave shall be let go, a free person to compensate for the tooth, right? So if you're a slave owner and you take out the eye of a slave or the tooth of a slave, they gotta go. Right? So here's just one more right for slaves back in that society. Now we have laws concerning property, right? And this is also going to talk about the sanctity of life. We have a lot of stuff about the sanctity of life in this section too. When an ox gores a man or woman to death, the ox shall be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall not be liable. Right? And this goes back to what Altus was saying earlier, right? The sanctity of life is expressed in this passage so far to say that if an ox kills a person, you can't even eat its flesh, right? Human life is so sacred that even that if an ox kills a person, you can't even eat its flesh. You got to like burn the whole thing and get rid of it because the, 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 that ox did such a horrible thing by taking that person's life. You can't even let the ox, like, first of all, you got to kill the ox and then you can't even eat it. It's got, to, it's got to be completely burned or buried or something. You cannot, like, this is even further talking about the sanctity of life in this passage here. But, on the other hand of things, if the ox has killed people in the past, right? So, so if an ox kills a person for the first time, the owner's not liable. It's not the owner's fault that the ox killed a person because the owner didn't know. But, if the ox has killed people in the past and its owner has been warned but has not restrained it and it kills a man or a woman, then the ox shall be stoned and its owner shall also be put to death, right? So the idea is the owner knew that this ox has killed people in the past, but he has done nothing about it. Therefore, this time the owner shall also be put to death. Could you apply the ox to corporations? I mean, ooh, that's tough. I mean, I think this law could go for, like, animals in general, right? Like, if you have a dog, if you have a dog and you're at the park and it attacks a person, right, 
you you either got to put it down or you got to not take it to the park anymore, right? Because the idea is if that dog goes back to the park again and attacks a person, then you knew the dog was going to do that. It's your fault. You're liable. You know, you you chose to let that dog who you knew attacked people in the past come to the park and attack another person, right? Like if I'm over a corporation, my product kills people and I just put turn a blind eye into it, then what's the difference in this and that? I mean... I, I, I see exactly what you're saying. I mean, I think it would be a good point. Like, I guess it depends on the scale is what I'm thinking, right? Like, I think it depends on the scale and the intent. And I think that's where, you know, wisdom and the Holy Spirit would come into play, right? Because obviously that's what we believe as Christians. We believe that if we're going to p- apply any of these laws to today or if we are going to... Um, you know, make laws surrounding, like, like guns, for instance, right? There are no guns in the Bible. We don't know what to do about guns. But there is stuff in the Bible about the sanctity of life. And there are laws about self-defense. And there are laws about uh, weaponry and stuff like that. So we have to have wisdom today as Christians. And we have to pray. And we have to work with the Holy Spirit to help figure out what the laws would be for today. Right? So let's say we're in a small company. And there's a machine that has killed a person because it's unsafe then yes, you know, that's pretty easy. But let's, I'll say on the other hand, you know, like this was a common thing that happened recently. Um, There was a caffeinated drink that a store sold and it was clearly a caffeinated drink, but there were a couple people that died from drinking the caffeinated drink. So the idea is then do, is the company does the company then have to take said drink off the store because a couple people were irresponsible and did not know how to, uh, you know, tell whether they could drink the caffeinated drink or not? I think that would be the question then, right? I think the scale of it would have to be taken into, into account. Are there like two people out of 100,000 who didn't know what they were doing? Uh, or is it like a small company of 10 people and there's clearly something that is dangerous that needs to be taken care of? You know, that would be an interesting way to put it. Or like, what if there's a certain medication that has been known to potentially be hazardous to the point of death, but also has a lot of benefits, right? Should it then be warned to the person, hey, this could, you know, this could lead to death. But also, I guess, you know, that would have to be, that that would be what I would think, at least. I think it would have to do with the scale, uh, what it has to do with, like, is it the people's fault or is it the product's fault? Um, stuff like that. Like, cause the other thing could be, what if it was the man who provoked the ox, right? Is it then the man's fault and not the ox's fault? Everything can lead to death with misuse. Exactly. Right. So that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, you know, like the same thing here, you know, I think this law specifically has to do with an ox who is unprovoked. Like if the ox was provoked by a man, I feel like that'd be different. It's like, oh, the ox killed this dude. Well, yeah, but it's not really the ox's fault. You know, the ox killed the dude because the guy was trying to kill it or, you know, was provoking it by some means, you know. So, exactly, everything can lead to death with misuse. I I think, yeah, that would be something we'd have to pray about and have wisdom about with the Holy Spirit. So continuing on, if a ransom is imposed on the owner, then the owner shall pay whatever is imposed for the redemption of the victim's life. If it gores a boy or girl, the owner shall be dealt with according to the same rule. Up here in this section, if the ox gores a male or female slave, the owner shall pay to the slave owner 30 shekels of silver and the ox shall be stoned. Um, This 30 shekels shekels of silver thing is a Greek thing um, by the time of the Septuagint. If you'll remember, if you'll remember... Judas sold Jesus for 30 shekels of silver. The reason being that in the Roman Empire, 30 shekels of silver was the price for a human life or for a slave. Um, So that's why the 30 shekels of silver is put here. It probably would have been a different amount of compensation back then, but we don't really... It's translated here because we have a better idea of what a shekel meant to the Greek uh, and Jewish audience. Um... So I'm assuming that's why the 30 shekels of silver is put here uh, instead of like a Hebrew measurement, Uh, probably because we don't know too much about the Hebrew measurements for money, Uh, especially back during the time of Moses. (laughs) 
you must save a life and preserve a life, but just because you see someone in the ocean doesn't mean you need to swim out and drag them to the shore to prevent them from drowning just because the possibility exists. Well, yeah, I mean, like, it, it, that also has to do with the, yeah, I mean, exactly. I don't even know if I have to add anything to that. <laughs> If someone leaves a pit open or digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit shall make restitution, giving money to the owner but keeping the dead animal, right? So here again, um, you know, you have to give restitution for damaged proper, property, uh, animal, uh, and if someone someone's ox hurts the ox of another so that it dies, that, then they shall sell the, li the live ox and divide the price of it, and the dead animal they shall also divide. But if it was known that the ox was accustomed to gore in the past and his owner has not restrained it, the owner shall restore ox for ox, but keep the dead animal. Uh, so this is under the same assumption as the starting one up here, but instead of it being a man or a woman, it is another ox. Now we get down to laws of restitution. Uh, I'm going to start skimming a little bit more than I have been, uh, unless if there's like a good point that I want to make, because I feel like a lot of the points that I've already made apply to these ones, you know, the sanctity of life, justice, uh, looking out for the marginalized, kind of a lot of the stuff that I've already said is going to apply to these upcoming verses. Uh, so if there's any other questions, of course, feel free to ask them. But since I've already made a lot of the points that I want to make with this section, I'm going to kind of start breezing through a little bit more of them, especially since they start to get a little bit repetitive, right? When someone steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, the thief shall pay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. The sheep shall make restitution, but if unable to do so, shall be sold for the theft. So for this one, for instance, right? Stealing, right? So this is going back to the command, the ten, out of the Ten Commandments, the commandment to do not steal, right? And this is expanding upon what happens if somebody steals. What do you do about that? Uh, and in here, you have to repay back five times the amount of ox you stole or four times the amount of sheep you stole. So you have to not only pay back the person if you steal, but you also have to give them back four times what you stole, right? Think about uh, the tax collector Jesus spoke to, right? In the Gospels, you know, Jesus speaks with this tax collector and the tax collector comes to Christ and he's he's like you know what i've been stealing off of these people for so long not only a while will i pay you back what i stole from you i will give you back three times right so the idea is if you steal you should not only pay the person back but you should give them back even more than you stole also if the thief is unable, unable to make restitution they shall be sold into slavery for the theft because remember slaves are sold because of debts. They sell themselves into slavery because of debtage, right? If a thief is found breaking in and is beaten to death, no blood to gold is incurred. Self-defense. This is what I was just talking about. There are laws in the Old Testament regarding self-defense. If a thief is found breaking in and beaten to death, no blood guilt is incurred. So this goes back to the, the, the law up here. Let me go back to the Ten Commandments. That is why more modern English translations translate this as you shall not murder instead of you shall not kill. Older English translations translate this as you shall not kill. Poor, it's a poor translation. I don't think there's any other way to put it. It's a poor translation. The better translation is you shall not murder, right? And this is another prime example of that because this is advocating for self-defense. If a thief is found breaking in and is beaten to death, no blood guilt is incurred the person was self-defending themselves. But if it happens after sunrise, blood guilt is incurred. So the idea here is um, in the night, right, you don't have much of a way to react. If it's during sunrise and you kill the person, it's, it's the reason for this goes back to what Zev was saying about the meditation, the, the premeditation to kill. Um, and we have laws about this in America as well, right? You have the right to self-defend yourself, but you also don't have the right to just kill someone because they walk onto your property, right? In America, you can kill someone who's breaking into your house and you feel threatened, but if somebody just walks onto your property, you can't just shoot them and kill them, right? Because that's, that's more premeditation to kill rather than feeling threatened. Right, and the same thing here. If it happens after sunrise and the sun is up and the person's breaking in and you beat them to death, you probably did it just to kill them for the sake of killing them rather than out of self-defense. Um, so the idea is the same thing here. You have the right to self-defense, but you do not have the right to kill somebody for no reason. 
When the animal, whether ox or donkey or sheep, is found alive in the thief's possession, the thief, the thief shall pay double. Right? So not only does the uh, does a thief have to pay back what they stole, they have to pay back double. When someone causes a field or vineyard to be grazed over, or lets livestock loose to graze in someone else's field, restitution must, shall be made from the best in the owner's field or vineyard. Uh, so pay back if you incur damage on someone else's property. When fire breaks out and catches in thorns that the stacked grain or the standing grain or, or the field is consumed, the one who started the fire shall make full restitution. Once again, you incur damage on someone else's property, pay them back full, fully. When someone delivers to a neighbor money or goods for safekeeping and they are stolen from the neighbor's house, then the thief is caught, they shall pay double. Once again, pay them back, give them more. If the thief is not caught, the owner of the house shall be brought before God to determine whether or not the owner had laid hands on the neighbor's goods. Right? So this, believe it or not, can you believe it? Can you believe it? This is innocent before proven guilty before America. That's a little crazy. I mean, America, one of the things that Amer America has been made famous for is that they have in their law that every person is innocent until proven guilty, which was a revelation in terms of legal issues worldwide, because that had never been a thing. Except, actually, it was. Here, in the Bible, declared by God to the Israelites way back, like, thousands of years ago. <laughs> So that's pretty cool. You know, innocent before proven guilty, you know, it's pretty cool, you know? So right here, if the thief is not caught, the owner shall be brought before God and God will determine if the person was guilty or not, right? The person is innocent before brought before God and God will determine whether or not the owner had laid hands on that neighbor's goods. The, oh, the robber is innocent until proven guilty. In any case of disputed ownership, including ox, donkey, sheep, clothing, or any other loss, of which one party says, this is mine, the case of both parties shall come before God. The one who God condemns shall pay double to the other. Right? Same thing. When someone delivers to, an, an, to another a donkey, ox, sheep, or any other animal for safekeeping, and it dies or is injured or is carried off without anyone seeing it, an oath before the Lord shall decide between the two of them that the one has not laid hands on the property of the other. Once again, innocent until proven guilty by God. The owner shall accept the oath, and no restitution shall be made. But if it was stolen, restitution shall be made to the owner. If it was mangled by beasts, let it be brought as evidence. Restitution shall not be made, for the mangled remains. When someone borrows an animal from another, and it is injured or dies, the owner not being present, present, full restitution shall be made. If the owner was present, there shall be no restitution. If it was hired, only the hiring fee is due. Um, right, so the idea is... So, so this is also, uh, you know, if the owner was present when the animal died that he had borrowed, then he is liable for its death because he could have probably done something about it. But if the owner is not present when the animal is killed, potentially something came in and killed it, like a wolf or uh, something like that. If that is the case, then the owner is not guilty and he should not pay restitution. Uh, well, he has to pay. He has to give the, the hiring fee but he does not have to pay full restitution because uh, he was not present. He could not stop it. Or wait, is it the other way around? Sorry, that might be the other way around. Um, yeah, sorry. There's a different one that says that. This one's the other way around. Sorry, I got them mixed up. Sorry about that. I'm not perfect. Forgive me. <laughs> uh, this, is the, this is the one that's the other way around. If the owner is not present, full restitution should be made because he was not present to take care of the animal, right? Because he was not watching actively and taking care of the animal that he had hired, that he borrowed. But if the owner was present, there's probably nothing that he could have done about it. Therefore, there's no restitution. All right, continuing on here. We got a little bit more to go through. When a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged to be married and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. That's pretty countercultural, too. You want to talk about more things that are countercultural in this law? You can't just sleep with someone and get away with it. Bro, this law, this law makes us as like, th this law right here makes us as Americans look like barbarians. Like, the Hebrews had it more right in their law than we do. 
you know, you look at the rest of this law with the slaves and the sacrifices and all this other stuff, and you're like, oh, man, they were so barbarous. You know, God really did have to come in and slowly correct them over time. No, no, we're the barbarians here. We just sleep around with whoever we want, and we can get away with it. No, they, they had it better than we did in their law. They We're the barbarians con compared to them. You know, you sleep with someone, you pay the price, you take them as a wife. We should put that in our law here in America. Goodness gracious, we, we've friggin' messed up. We're, <laughs> like, for real, we're, we're like barbarians consider, con compared to the Hebrews when it comes to this law. You know, we just sleep around with whoever we want all the time, and... You know, but the Hebrews, they had it right. You know, make her your wife. There's a consequence for sleeping with a person, right? This goes back, you know, God made it. One man and one wife. You break that and you want to have more than one wife. Go ahead. I'm, but you got to make her your wife. You got to make her your wife if you want to sleep with someone. You can't just, you know, sleep around and get away with it. <laughs> but if her father refuses to give her to him, he shall pay an equal amount to the bride. So, so there's, the other, there's the other end of this, right? There's a right to the father and the daughter as well. Right. If the father sees the man as a bad man to be her husband, then he has the right to say no. Like, you can't have her. Like, you're not a good husband. You're not going to take my daughter. Um, and in that case, then the man has to pay the father and the family uh, to for the for having done that. You shall not permit a f for female sorcerer to live. <laughs> um, this verse uh, was used for some pretty heinous crimes. <laughs> Uh, do the Salem witch trials ring a bell? Um, it was, the, yeah, yeah. Th this is a, a verse that, you know, led to the Salem witch trials. Um, yeah, the Bible does talk about putting female sorcerers to death, which is actually, uh, uh, actually, fun fact, I do actually want to talk about a story regarding this real quick. Um, so Saul, King Saul, right? The, the king before King David, King Saul. He went to a female sorceress. And what was her first response? She says, don't kill me. Right? Because Saul, being the king of Israel, who is supposed to be faithful to the law of Israel, was supposed to kill all female sorcerers. That's where that story, that's why she has the reaction she does in that story. And also, that has theological applications to that story in showing how far Saul has devalued himself, right? That's one more step down on Saul's journey to rock bottom, where now he is consulting a female sorceress instead of uh, killing her. Um, this is to say, um, th this law is specific to Israel being female sorcerers because... I don't really know too much about it, but I know in those ancient cultures, more often than not, the females were the sorcerers. I don't really know too much about it, but I do know that there was a weird thing with females being the sorcerers and not men. Uh, but it's not always the case. Like, there were male sorcerers, too. Think about just earlier in this exact book, right? Earlier in this book, Pharaoh had magicians. He had sorcerers that were able to commit, that were able to do magic right? Pharaoh's sorcerers turned water into blood and they made frogs appear and they did all that stuff. Like they, they had power. They were real sorcerers. You know, like we, you know, we live here in America and we're like, that's ma like magic. The Bible says magic is real. Pfft, that's ridiculous. But the Bible talks about it. It's real. Like there were real sorcerers. And it's not that they just had their power because they were like Harry Potter magicians. They were like given their power by Satan right? Like, we as Christians believe in Satan and him having power and him being able to, and like the demons having power, but we we here in America think it's ridiculous that Satan and demons could empower people to do magical things. But I don't see where the disconnect comes in. Like, if we as Christians believe that demons and Satan exist and that they can do things in this world, then why don't we believe that they can partner with people to do miraculous things too? So I think it's real. <laughs> like, I think it's absolutely real that Satan and the demons can give people powers in the same way that they themselves have power to act on our world, right? 
I think it is real whenever it says that Pharaoh's magicians had power to do things, right? And I think it's very real that there were female sorcerers that were given power by demons, right? Um, actually, I haven't seen it personally, but as you guys know, I go to seminary, right? I'm on a seminary campus, and there are a lot of students here that I'm a student with on this campus who are missionaries from around the globe. Right? They've been missionaries and they come back and they want to get their master's degree. They want to get their master of divinity or whatever. And they tell stories of these places they've gone. You know, they go to the depths of Africa and they see real sorcerers, like doing real magic in front of their eyes. And they're like, their minds are like blown. They're like, this is real? Like I'm actually seeing this? then they have to reflect on that. They're like, well, why does this happen here in Africa, but it doesn't happen here in America? You know, want to know what they've concluded? I don't have too much time to get into this because it's already 1030, but um, you know what they've concluded? They've concluded Satan doesn't need to do all that crazy stuff here in America because he's already won here in America. <laughs> Not that he's won. Sorry, that's that's bad terminology. But he's winning. You know, Satan already controls so much of our country and our media and so much of this stuff that's going on in our country. Why does he need to do all this crazy stuff whenever he's already winning? He already has people doing his will through normal means. He doesn't have to do anything miraculous. Right? It's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. Right? In the book of Acts, we see that the Holy Spirit is more active because it was needed in those areas to, to spread the gospel. Right, And the same thing, I think, can be said for other places around the world. Not that the Holy Spirit is not active here in America, right? because as Christians, we believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Not that this Holy Spirit is not active here in America. But if you go to other regions of the world, like China, India, places where Christianity is oppressed, you see miraculous things being done all the time by the Holy Spirit. I think a lot of that is, well, first of all, it's due to the devotion of the followers. But also it's due to the fact that these Christians are actually being persecuted and they really need the extra help in the same way that we see the demons doing extra miraculous stuff in other parts of the world because they have to, right? Like in Africa, Christianity's winning. Over 90% of people in the country, in the continent of Africa are Christian right now. So of course the demons are having more of a reaction over there to the, Christ, the Christianity all around them. They're doing more miraculous things. There's more sorcerers popping up in Africa because Africa is 90% Christian. Anyways, I could go on a rant about that forever. Uh, I could go on a rant for about that forever if I if I had the opportunity, but we got a lot more to go through. So, but as I say, you should not permit a female sorcerer to live. I don't think that's just specifically tar targeting females. I think that's specifically to them because for for whatever reason in their cultures, it was common that females were sorcerers and not men. Uh, I don't know why that was the case. Uh, maybe there's some cultural reason for that, or maybe some cult or something i'm not sure i'm not sure why it's specifically the females that are targeted in this law uh well I, sorry i know why the females are targeted in this law the females are targeted in this law because it was basically just female sorcerers there weren't really male sorcerers i don't know the reason why there were basically only female sorcerers and not male sorcerers as well that's the part that i don't know anyways whoever lies with an animal shall be put to death bcld bestiality is uh <laughs> but basically god saying bestiality is like uh, a horrible crime against nature <laughs> don't do it you'll be put to death <laughs> uh whoever sacrifices any god other than the lord alone shall be devoted to destruction this is another one that i didn't get to really look up as much as i would have liked to have i'm not sure why it says shall be devoted to destruction i would want to look more into this in the hebrew the original language because uh, all these other ones say, shall not be permitted to live, shall be put to death. But for some reason, this one says, shall be devoted to destruction. And that's very clearly different. I'm not sure what the difference is. I would want to read the Hebrew. Um, but anyways, that one's different for whatever reason. I'm not sure. The point is, don't sacrifice to any god other than the Lord alone. It's pretty bad. <laughs> now here we get an interesting one. Back to the sanctity of life. 
you shall not wrong or oppress a resident alien, right? So a foreigner living among you. You shall not oppress a foreign person living among your own people. For you were once aliens in the land of Egypt, right? The, Israel, the Israelites were foreigners in a foreign land, but yet God showed his mercy upon them and saved them. In the same way, the Israelites cannot abuse a foreigner in their own land because they themselves were once foreigners. Uh, and this is once again back to the sanctity of life. You shall not only treat your own people as sacred, because like that's another thing back then. In ancient times, um, there was a real sense of nationalism nationalism is not really the right word but anyways like each distinct people group right like your laws only applied to the people of your own people group and other peoples were seen as different than you they were different they didn't have the same rights that you did uh you know you could go to war with them whatever right but the israelites were contrary once again once again this is countercultural to the other societies back then by saying that aliens living among you, foreigners living among you, shall have the same rights as you. You shall not oppress them. because Just because they're a foreigner does not mean that you have the right to treat them any differently than you or your neighbor. Once again, you shall not abuse a widow or orphan, right? So why is this all put in the same paragraph? It's because this is all talking about marginalized people and how you shall not treat marginalized people poorly, right? Foreigners, widows, and orphans were the marginalized people of the ancient times. There was no possible way to be more marginalized back then in the ancient days other than to be a foreigner, a widow, or an orphan. So that is who God looks out for, is the marginalized in the society of the ancient peoples, which was the foreigners, the widows, and the orphans. If you do abuse them, they, when they cry out to me, I will surely heed their cry, and my wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall become widows and your children orphans. Why is this command so strong? This is a really strong command. My wrath will burn, I will hear their cry, and I will kill you with the sword. Right? God isn't just saying you shall not permit someone to live. He's actively saying I will kill you. That is very different, right? They shall be put to death versus I will kill you. Those are very different lines of thought. But this is to show God has a heart for the marginalized. God has a heart for the oppressed. Right? All these other things, you know, God is saying like, this is wrong, this is right, all this stuff. But this one, God has like his heart in. Because God really cares for justice and he cares for the oppressed. Right? Think about it. The Israelites are founded on the fact that they were an oppressed foreign people. Who God saved. Like, arguably, arguably, the second greatest miracle of the whole Bible is the Exodus event, which is an event made to free slaves from captivity. God has a heart for the marginalized and the oppressed. And this is clearly something that we as Christians should hold on to, is the idea that we are also responsible for looking out for the oppressed in our society and looking out for justice. Of course, in America, that can mean... <sighs> Sorry, let me go back just a second. I know for all my American, my fellow Americans... My fellow Americans. <laughs> Sorry. I know for all my fellow Americans that that can lead into some political debate and some political, you know, just that very wording can lead into stereotypes and political alignments. I'm not here to make any political statements regarding whatever party or social justice, whatever you want to name it, right? But I am saying as a Christian, we are to seek justice for those in need. Whatever political stance you have, whatever you feel about 
political correctness and social justice and anything like that, right? Whatever you think as a fellow American about all these things, there is a common thing that we need to know, which is to look out for those who are oppressed and marginalized. I'll leave it at that. If you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you shall not deal with them as a creditor. You shall not deal exact interest from them. If you take, you shall not ex, ex, ex wait, you shall not exact in, interest from them. Sorry. So actually, here's an interesting one. This is really contrary to modern America and modern capitalism, right? This is really interesting contrast to modern America, modern capitalism, because the Bible actually advocates for no interest. If you lend money, you should not deal with them as a creditor and you should not exact interest from them, right? If you are giving away money to be lent out, you should not exact interest. That's interesting. If you take your neighbor's cloak in pawn, you shall restore it before the sun goes down, for it may be your neighbor's only clothing to use as a cover. And what else shall that person sleep? And if your neighbor cries out to me, I will listen, for I am compassionate. So once again, I will hear the cries of those around me, and I will listen to them. Just as God he heard the cries of the Israelites, he will hear the cries of those in need. You shall not revile God or curse a leader of your people, right? So immediately, this is going to bring up reactions of, uh, well, what do we do about a bad leader, right? What if you were a German in the 1940s? Uh, should you not curse Hitler? This is a little bit different. Remember, this is God speaking to the Israelites, and God is the one who is ordaining the leaders of the Israelites. It's a little bit different in this society than it would be for another modern society today. God is actually choosing the leaders himself. So God is saying, listen, don't revoke me and don't curse the leaders that I put above you. It's a little bit different, right? There's a nuance there. You shall not delay to make offerings from the fullness of your harvest and from the outflow of your presses, right? So don't delay uh, in making, you know, offerings back to God. The firstborn of your sons you shall give to me, right? So this, go, this is a, a twofold thing, right? Back after the Exodus, God said that all of your firstborn animals you shall sacrifice to me on the eighth day. And all of your firstborn sons you shall consecrate to me through circumcision. Right? So there's a nuance here that's not mentioned in this verse that is mentioned earlier in the book of Exodus. Because right now it says all of your firstborn sons and all your firstborn oxen and sheep shall come to me on the eighth day. You shall give it to me. But the nuance here is made earlier in the book of Exodus. Because earlier in the book of Exodus God says on the eighth day you shall sacrifice the firstborn oxen or sheep but you shall circumcise on the eighth day your firstborn son. You shall be people consecrated to me. Therefore, you shall not eat meat that is mangled by beasts in the field. You shall throw it to dogs. Uh, so don't eat roadkill. <laughs> Essentially, don't eat roadkill. Uh, you know, you don't know how that thing died. It's a bad idea. All right, we're getting to the end here. We got three more little sections here. Um, justice for all. You shall not spread a false report. Don't lie. Don't gossip, right? This is this is the New Testament thing that Paul talks about. Don't gossip. Don't lie. Uh, but in the Hebrew, they didn't have those words, so they said, don't sp spread a false report. You shall not join hands with the wicked to act as a malicious witness. You know, don't help the wicked. It's a bad idea. Even if you yourself are not doing anything wrong, don't encourage the wicked. You know, I, I don't know if I have any more to say on that. You shall not follow a majority in wrongdoing. Right? Even if the majority is wrong, doesn't make it right if you contribute. When you bear witness in a lawsuit, you shall not side with the majority so as to prefer justice. Right? Once again, you shall not follow the majority in wrongdoing, nor shall you be partial to the poor in a lawsuit. Right? Don't let your own inclinations and biases and majority vote sway you from true justice. When you come upon your enemy's ox or donkey going astray, you shall bring it back. 
right? If you find something, don't take it for yourself or just let it be. Bring it back to the owner. You know, if you find a lost cat or dog on the street, bring it back to its owner or try your best at least. When you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden and you would hold back from setting it free, you must set it free. Um, well, this is a real, little bit of an interesting one. Um, even if a donkey... Even if... Wait. When you see a donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden, you would not... Okay. Sorry. I had to reread it. Um, I forgot what it was saying. Uh, anyways. So the idea is... If you find the animal of someone you hate, it's, it's kind of like really specific. Let me try and think of like a modern analogy, right? Let's say you have a neighbor that you hate, you know, and it's got this dog and it poops all over your lawn and you kind of hate it and you hate your neighbor, but the dog one day, you know, gets stuck. A tree falls down in your lawn and it's stuck under the tree. Just because you hate your neighbor doesn't mean you shouldn't let the dog free. Same thing with this. If you find a donkey lying under its burden, it can't get up, it's stuck, but you hate its owner, just because you hate its owner doesn't mean you shouldn't let the donkey free. You gotta let it free. You shall not pervert the justice due to your poor in their lawsuits. Keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent of those in the right. And those in the right, sorry. Do not kill the innocent and don't kill those in the right, for I will not acquit the guilty. You shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the officials and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. I mean, a lot of this stuff's pretty basic, right? Don't take a bribe. Don't pervert justice. You shall not, and here we have again, we see this law twice. So this one's really important to God, right? You shall not oppress a resident alien. You know the heart of an alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. He says this one twice. God says this law twice in this section. Don't oppress a resident alien. <laughs> he says it twice in this section. It's very clearly important to God. First, And then we get into Sabbath and the annual festivals. right? So Sabbath, this is going back to the fourth uh, of the Ten Commandments. Take a Sabbath. For six years, so there's also a sabbatical year. Um, some Christians I know follow this. I know not all Christians follow this, but I actually do know some Christians who follow this. Um, actually, fun fact, the president of our campus, uh, served for six years and he just took a sabbatical this past year, uh, because it was his seventh year. Uh, so there are actually some Christians that follow the sabbatical year. Um, not all of them do, but a lot do. Uh, well, not a lot. There are some Christians who follow the sabbatical year. But essentially, the sabbatical year is the same thing as Sabbath, but it's for years. So for six years, you work, and then on the seventh, you rest. Uh, actually, I have a fun story with this one that I actually just... I always actually wasn't planning on bringing this up, but it actually just came to mind. So for six years, you shall sow your land and gather in its yield. But on the seventh year, you shall let your land rest, so that the poor of your people may eat, and that what they leave, the wild animals may eat. You shall do the same with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. So I actually have a little bit of a fun story with this one. So my granddad... My granddad has a garden. Uh, he has a little garden that he works on. Uh, my granddad was actually a farmer for a lot of his, the end of his life. He had uh, big fields, right? So uh, like countryside territory. He's got these massive fields and a big freaking tractor. And like he uh, used to like get corn and other crops on mass and he would sell them, right? Had this big, big farm, right? Um. If you guys didn't know that, I come from a, a countryside background. <laughs> um, I, I come from the, the, the farms and stuff, you know. But uh, anyways, so he, uh, he he's older now. Uh, clearly, he's a lot older now. Um, and he no longer is able to tend to these fields that are on the property anymore. He actually has other... He actually uh, rents them out. So he actually rents out the fields to other farmers that he can they can use them and plant crops and sell them uh, because he's too old to work them anymore. Uh, but he has a little garden that he tends, you know, maybe about the size of my room, maybe a little bit bigger. Uh, and he grows his own crops and he eats them and then he sells a couple of them, gives some to the rest of the family, stuff like that. And he's had it for seven years now. For six years, he tended the garden 
The seventh year, he didn't do anything with the garden. The seventh year, he let the garden rest. He didn't work on it. The eighth year, he came back, and he worked on it again. Uh, this was just last year, I believe. And on the eighth year, he had the garden, and he redid it, and he was so blessed, right? He was so blessed by it because he, he saw this command. He saw this command to let the, the, the fields rest on the seventh year, and he wanted to follow it. So on the eighth year, he planted his crops, and he had, like, the most incredible yield ever. Like, all of his friends at church and all of the fellow farmers and stuff, they were like, how in the world do you get tomatoes that juicy? And how do you get, like, th these amazing, like, whatever, right? And everyone was, like, amazed. They're like, these are the greatest whatever, you name it. Because he plants, like, anything and everything. He, he has, like, everything he plants. Like, all of his fruits and vegetables for the year. Um, and everyone was amazed by it. And he was like, well, I let it rest for a year. I took, I, the land had a sabbatical. So that's a little bit of a cool story. Anyways, God's commands work in the world. Follow God's commands, guys. <laughs> and then here's the Sabbath command again. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, so that your ox and your donkey may have relief, and your homeborn slave and the resident alien may be refreshed. Be attentive to all that I have said to you. Do not invoke the names of other gods, and do not let them be heard on your lips. So back once again, um, take the seventh day and rest and then finally one last section we're almost to the end of this law section <laughs> the annual festivals three times in the year you shall hold a festival to me to god you shall observe the festival of unleavened bread as i commanded you and you shall eat unleavened bread for seven days at the appointed time of the month of abib for in it you came out of egypt right so this is going back to earlier in the book right after the exodus god commanded that the, you shall celebrate the festival of unleavened bread to to remember me saving you from the land of Egypt um, and no one shall appear before me empty empty handed right so everybody has to come to the festival and celebrate uh, you shall observe the festival of harvest of the first fruits of your labor of what you sow in the field right so this is the second festival and essentially the second festival is to celebrate the first fruits of your labor just like it says right so whenever you get the first crops of your field everybody has to celebrate uh, and have a festival to celebrate the first fruits in the same way that you celebrate the firstborn son and the firstborn uh or the firstborn son and the firstborn uh of your flocks you celebrate the first fruits of your labor in the fields and then the third one, you shall observe the festival of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in from the field the fruits of your labor. So whenever at the end of the year you gather in all the rest of the crop, you also should celebrate that. Uh, so then three times in the year all your males shall appear before the Lord God. Uh, this is to say all three of the festivals, all of your men shall appear before God in the festivals. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened, or let the fat of my festival remain until the morning. This is specific law for them with the leavened bread and the, the blood and, and how they viewed those, right? The choicest of your first fruits of the ground you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. And then there's a weird one here. You shall boil a kid in its mother's milk. I'm going to be honest, I don't know what this one means. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what this one means. I, th this is like, I... I, I to be honest, I didn't have time to look this one up. Uh, obviously, this was the very va last verse on the list, uh, and I got to about here in my studies before Bible study today, uh, so I actually didn't get to really study these festivals anymore. I wanted to get, um, I wanted to get a little bit further in the in my studies, uh, so, that, so that's why like this week this week's been a really long section with a lot of individual laws. Uh, I wasn't able to, like, study every single one specifically. Um, I wasn't able to study, like, every single one specifically. Um, and I wasn't able to get the whole way through it. Uh, but I tried my best. Um, so this one. I, I did have the same inclination as Cole does. Uh, so Cole just put in the chat that kid is referring to a baby goat. Um, which is actually something I could probably look up. I could probably look up the word. No results. Interesting. Uh, what if I do look up? Uh, yeah, there we go. So I wasn't able to look it up before, but Cole was right. 
kid, the young of a goat. Uh, it was used for food. Mosaic law forbid to dress a kid in the milk of its dam. A law which is thrice repeated, Exodus 23, 19, which is our one today, and two others. Among the various reasons assigned for this law that, that appears to be the most satisfactory with which regards it as a protest against cruelty and outraging the order of nature. Okay. A kid cooked in its mother's milk is a gross, unwholesome dish and calculated to kindle animal and ferocious passions. And on this account, Moses may have forbidden it. Besides, it is even yet associated with immoderate, immoderate feasting and originality. Was connected with idolatrous sacrifice. Okay, so there's a lot of things here. So yeah, cool. You're right. Your, your, your inclination was right. Uh, that was my initial inclination as well as I was probably talking about a, a young goat. Um, so yeah, was, this is talking, uh, don't boil a goat in its mother's milk uh, because it's cruel and inhumane and it actually probably had to do with animal sacrifices. <laughs> or it had to do with uh, sacrifices to other gods is what I mean. So, I know it's getting late. Uh, but yeah, so going through this section... There's a lot to do with, you know, like we look at the Old Testament law today and we're like, yeah, we don't have to follow that. You know, why do we have to follow the Old Testament law? Well, we have the New Testament, right? But as I just read through this, as we all just read through this passage, is there not so much good stuff to glean from this? Like clearly we don't celebrate these same festivals anymore as Christians, right? So this is a little bit different for us. But still, the command to remember how God saved the Israelites from Egypt is the same thing as the Christian command to remember Christ's sacrifice through the Lord's Supper, right? Do not inhumanely kill animals. Look out for the orphan and the oppressed. Take a day to rest. Do not oppress the resident alien. Do not pervert justice. Do not take a bribe, right? Even though this is a law for a different time and a different people, there is so much truth in this law that can be applied to today. Even though this is law for a different culture and a different time, so much of this law applies to all people across all time. There is so much truth in this section. There is so much truth in this section, and it just takes a lot of wisdom and a lot of prayer to read through these sections and to see the truth for what it is. Um, obviously, you also have to take in the cultural context into account. You have to remember how it is that the Israelites lived. You have to understand the ancient cultures to understand why some of this law was here in the first place and why it was there at all, um, especially the stuff with the slaves. Like We have a different connotation that we bring to the text whenever we see the stuff about the slaves. But there's still so much truth in the slavery sections about the sanctity of life and how all people should be treated the same and how you cannot just take any person and make them a slave. They have to sell themselves into slavery first, right? You know, don't murder people, right? This is what you shall do if someone kills someone. This is what you shall do if someone steals something. This is what you should do about wild animals that kill. Like, this is all stuff that is absolutely applicable to a modern day society. If you were to read through this, understand the cultural context, and uh, have the wisdom and work with the Holy Spirit to apply today, this is absolutely stuff that can apply to today. Uh, and there's two sections I want to read from a commentary, uh, my Word on Fire Bible. Uh, I really like how this words things, obviously. Um, so here's a little section from Bishop Barron uh, in regards to this law section. It's a little bit longer, so I'm gonna start reading. Uh, and I quote, before transitioning to a consideration of the liturgical laws that ought to govern Israel, the author of Exodus spends time in chapters 21 through 24 exploring some causistic applications of the general moral law articulated through the Ten Commandments. Some speculate that this section of Exodus, which does indeed have similarities with the Code of Hammurabi and other ancient legal documents, represents a particularly ancient strand of the biblical tradition. Chapter 21 commences with a discussion of the proper treatment of slaves, a theme that has, at least in the past, in the last 250 years, deeply bothered many biblically formed people. How could the sacred word of God speak so blithely of this horrific practice of slavery, 
calmly laying out certain restrictions and caveats while seemingly to overlook that slavery in of itself is a moral outrage. And to be sure, positive or at least morally bland references to slavery can be found throughout the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, a fact often averred to by defenders of the practice as late as the mid-19th century. A distinction made by the contemporary theologian William Placker is useful here, namely, between what is in the Bible and what the Bible teaches. There is no question that approbation of slavery is in the Bible, but what so many of those opponent, opponents of slavery throughout history, who drew inspiration precisely from the scriptures, clearly show is that the practice is not necessarily what the Bible teaches. To determine this latter truth, we must attend not simply to individual passages, but rather to the overarching themes, patterns, and trajectories of the third of the entire Bible. With that principle in mind, one might remark that the scripture's clear insistence upon the dignity of the individual, the command to love even our enemies, the injunction to care for the most vulnerable, the university the universality of the offer of salvation, and many other related motifs besides and conclude, along with many fervently, abo fervently Christian abolitionists of the 18th and 19th centuries, that the Bible does not in fact teach the moral legitimacy of slavery. A second theme from this section that I should like to consider is the so-called lex talionosis which is formulated in Exodus 21, 23 to 25, which states, If any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burned, wound for wound, and stripe for stripe. On the face of it, this prescription seems brutal indeed, but we must consider it within the cultural framework of the time and in light of the natural tendencies of aggrieved human beings. First, a consensus of commentators from both antiquity and the medieval period is that the intention of the author is to provide a rational basis for a monetar monetary compensation for an offense. Knowing full well that it would be next to impossible to apply this law, literally in regard to practical injuries, the biblical lawmakers were providing a template for at least relatively accurate monetary settlements. A second observation is that, if anything, the lex talionosis sets a severe limit to brutality. In the, heat of the, in the heat of anger and filled with resentment, most wounded parties would seek revenge in a completely disproportionate manner, say, for example, killing a man for robbery. By setting offense and retribution in such tight correlation, this famous law constrains the furies rather than unleashing them. So, that's a good section. I think it talks about a lot of what we've already talked about. You know, sanctity of life is what is expressed here in this section, not an advocacy for slavery or an advocacy for any of those other things. Finally, there is one other section here. This one's a lot shorter, also from Bishop Barron, and it is on the passion for the marginalized. This one goes, and I quote, in this legal or moral section of the book of Exodus, we find the extraordinary command to care for the weakest and most vulnerable in society. This is extraordinary, for it stood in opposition to what was taken for granted in the environing cultures of the time. In almost all of the other settings, foreigners were the object of contempt, and as such would be enslaved, mistreated, or put to death with impunity. But Israel heard the revolutionary teaching grounded in fellow feeling that they should have compassion on those in their midst who are foreigners and outsiders. Why should they love such people? Because they themselves had once been slaves in Egypt. Like it or not, we are connected to one another. And then Exodus expresses concern for widows and orphans, for those who have no one to care for them. There was, of course, at the time, no social safety net for such widows and orphans. If their families were gone, or their relatives too poor, widows and orphans were without hope. If these vulnerable people are ignored, Exodus tells us God will become very angry. From this passion for the marginalized comes the great social justice tradition of the Christian church. So, once again, God calls for the sanctity of life 
in these sections. God calls for justice, and God calls specifically for justice for the marginalized in society and those who are oppressed. So, that's what we should be doing. We should be treating all life as, sac as sacred. We should be looking out for those around us who are marginalized and put in the oppressed positions of our society. Once again, I am not taking any political stances here in America because those are very loaded terms here in our country. But I would like to use those terms without the political connotations involved. So that's what we should do. That's what we should do. That is our application for today, I believe at least. If anyone else has other applications that they would like, I mean, of course, there's probably a million applications you could make from this law section. But of course, if there's anything else that people would like to point out, if there's any other questions about this section that people would like to point out, feel free to point them out. If there's any other comments that people would want to make, questions, anything like that, feel free to ask them now. Um, I have said everything that I have had in my studies for this week. Um, and I believe that to be a good application. But and Nate, good stuff today, sir. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. I know it was a long section, um, a lot of individual laws um, and everything like that, a lot to go through. Um, I tried to touch on as much as I possibly could, and I tried to study as much as I could. Uh, obviously, over just this week with school and work and everything, I wasn't able to study absolutely everything super in-depth, every law and everything, but I tried to uh, do about as good as I possibly could. Uh, so thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but if there's nothing else, then I can bring up our prayer requests. So uh, I'm assuming probably everyone here knows uh, that we have a prayer request uh, board on our channel. Um, but if you don't know, we do have a Discord channel that I can link in the uh, thing right now. now. If you want to join a part of that, we have a lot of stuff that we do there. Of course, we announce future streams uh, that I'll get into in a second. Um, we have a Minecraft server that we play on, and we got a Clash Royale clan. If you want to join either of those and fellowship with us a little bit more, get to know us a bit more. Uh, of course, we have open voice channels and open text channels to do a lot of stuff. Um, but also, uh, the Prayer Request channel is one of the more uh, one of the ones that I like the most. Uh, and of course, we have a lot of prayer requests that come through there, and a lot of prayer requests that are answered. Um, we've actually had so many prayer requests that we get here in this section that we have decided to uh, try to condense them. Uh, so now, uh, the goal moving forward is to have a prayer list. Uh, so instead of it just being a prayer request channel with prayer requests from months back, uh, not knowing if they've been answered, not knowing what still needs prayer, uh, stuff like that, having to scroll through a million different conversations, uh, the goal is that hopefully we will have a prayer list that is updated every so once in a while. Uh, so that people can know what to still be praying for and they can know what has been answered, what praises there are. Um, so it makes it a little bit easier for people to know what to be praying for. Uh, and if anybody wants to go into the Discord and just look at the prayer list and start praying for some of these things, it should be a lot easier to know what to pray for. Um, so uh, I'm going to get to our prayer list. Uh, so first of all, our current out of our current prayers, the first one is Evan. Uh, who is one of the people who helped start this channel with me, a dear friend of mine, uh, still dealing with some medical issues and sickness. Uh, so please uh, continue prayer for him. Uh, some prayer requests for the special medic, which if you don't know, he's another Bible study uh, Twitch streamer, does Twitch streams where he does Bible studies. Uh, so you should go check him out. Uh, he has two prayer requests. The first one being to uh, be able to find the funding that he needs to go on a missions trip. Uh, and the second one for a friend of his who has been dealing with some medical issues as well. Um, next up on the list, we have Thomas. Uh, Thomas is asking for prayer for his mom, who's been dealing with bad breathing problems, and for his grandma dealing with memory loss and cardiac issues. Uh, we also have Emma, RPG Emma B, uh, another amazing Twitch streamer out there. You should go check her out. Um, she is amazing. Uh, she plays games with us sometimes as well. Um, she specifically has a prayer request. Uh, she's been dealing with cancer, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, so we want to be praying for her so that she can, uh, you know, for all of that in her life and so she can have wisdom to know what to do about it. Um, next prayer request, we have Leo. Leo is asking for prayer to be successful in school and also for his brother to heal from a surgery that he recently went through. Uh, we also have a prayer request. Uh, we have uh, from 2Jug. Uh, we don't know much about 2Jug, but he came in a little while ago and he asked for an unspoken prayer request. So we're still going to be praying for that for the time being. 
Um, we have Samuel Soros. Uh, he is asking for prayer for his brother. Uh, his brother is not a Christian, and he is asking for prayer so that he might be able to speak well uh, and so that his brother might come to Christ. We also have a prayer request for Kodo. Uh, Kodo is asking for a couple prayer requests, uh, which also, Kodo is another streamer as well, Kodo007. Uh, you should go check him out as well. I don't know if he's live tonight. Uh, he's usually live at similar times as us. Um, but if you want to go check out Kodo007, he does Worship Wednesdays. Uh, so he might be live currently with a Worship Wednesday if you want to go check him out right after we're done. Uh, but he's asking for a prayer requests for a couple things. First of all, he's asking for prayer for some friends of his. Uh, he's asking that they might be able to come to Christ as well. Uh, and he's also asking for prayer as he goes out and tries to find the right job uh, with all the interviews and stuff like that, that they might go well. Uh, prayer request for Zev, uh, who is currently Drift in our Twitch chat. Uh, he is asking for prayer because he is on Uversion's prayer request team and he needs wisdom as he approaches those prayer requests. Uh, we also have the Toxic Family, uh, Callie specifically of the Toxic Family. Uh, if you, she's the, another streamer. We have a lot of really good streamer friends out there. Uh, so go check them out as well. They also do Bible studies as well. Uh, they are asking for prayer for their son. Uh, their son currently, uh, he tore his ACL um, and he is asking, they're, they're asking for prayer that he can uh, get the right treatment that he needs for that and that he can heal from it. Uh, and they also, the Toxic Family also does a charity. Uh, it's called Laundry Love. Uh, and they're asking for funding for that charity. Uh, we also have Make It Rain. Make It Rain, another streamer, uh, is asking for prayer from healing from a recent uh, procedure that he went through. Uh, Lavender Snorlax, friend of mine from undergrad, uh, she is asking for prayer for her boyfriend uh, who is having a job interview coming up, so prayer for that. Uh, and two final prayer requests, uh, prayer for all the violence in the world currently, uh, general prayer request for all of that, uh, and then also a prayer request for uh, Viking, a uh, member of our channel. Uh, he has come by multiple times talking about his depression, and we want to have continued prayer for him as he works through all of that. Um, we have a couple praises that we want to ask, uh, that we want to bring forward and give praise for. Uh, first of all, Cole, who had a lot of things work out with school recently, a lot of hard things that were going on there that worked out, so praise for that. Also, uh, Elizabeth and her uh, Zeb, sorry, I'm, I don't remember the relationship. I believe husband. I believe it's her and her husband. I think they're married. Anyways, they're a couple. Uh, and they uh, had blowouts on their, their car, their tires, and they were able to get the tires that they needed at a good price that they were able to afford. So praise for that. And also a big praise for Lavender Snorlax as well, the one that I just brought up a little while ago with her boyfriend. Uh, she has been asking for prayer for months and months now about getting a teaching job and trying to go through interviews for that and getting a teaching placement and everything. Uh, and a big praise that everything worked out with the teaching job, and she is enjoying that quite a bit. Um, so praises for all of those. Uh, and Cole has one more. Pray for a guy I know. Uh, stuff is happening. I'm not talking about it right. I don't think he's a Christian. Okay. Yeah. And Cole, absolutely. Add that to the, the prayer list in the Discord. Uh, and I can add it to the prayer list. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you for Cole for letting us know. Um, so we'll add that to the prayer list as well. So yeah, if any of you, if you guys uh, would join me in prayer about all of those things, I pray that you would. Um, and absolutely. And uh, yeah, I guess if you guys will join me in prayer real quick. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you so much for today. Uh, thank you so much for being able to gather here and to talk about your word and to have a good time fellowshipping with one another. I thank you so much for it. And I pray that every person here gains something out of this conversation and had a good time. Uh, I know that I gained things out of this conversation and my day was really blessed as a result. Uh, today was a very hard day with a lot of things that happened. Um, <laughs> um, but this, being able to end my night on this was a big blessing. Uh, and I thank you so much for allowing me to do this and being able to help do this. And I pray that everybody here was blessed uh, by this conversation tonight just as much as I was. I pray as we go out into our week ahead uh, and our school and our work and everything in our lives ahead, I pray that we will uh, take these things to heart. I pray that we will take all of these things to heart, your law, uh, things that have truths for all people of all times. I pray especially that we will have a heart just as you do for the marginalized. I pray that we will have a heart for those who are oppressed. Um, I pray for, that we would have a heart for the widow, the orphan, and the alien in our society and whoever else might be in that group. Pray for all the prayer requests in our community. 
uh, all those in the Twitch chat and all of those in our Discord community. I pray for all of them that you would intercede in each situation and helping these people individually on all the ways that they need it specifically. Pray all of these things in your name. Amen. So, I had a good time. I hope all of you guys had a good time as well. Um, I am going to go check out real quick. Um, I'm going to see who's live on Twitch. I don't have much time tonight. I have to go get going. I have to get going so that I can take a phone call. Um, so I'm only going to do a raid if there's someone live that we should go do. Kodo's live. Okay, sweet. Let's go do Kodo. Um, like I said, I don't want to raid someone new tonight because I have a phone call that I have to take right after stream. And I know I won't be able to really participate all that much. Um, but let me pull up Kodo's stream and we can go raid him to bless his night. Um, solo queuing shenanigans. Oh, sorry. That's not what I meant to do. Uh, oh, it's not a worship Wednesday. Uh, well, I guess it's a short chill stream. Normally he does worship Wednesdays, so I'm guessing it's a short stream, so it's not the worship Wednesday today. Um, but yeah, let's go, let's go, uh, give Kodo a good time tonight. Um, so I'm going to type in the raid thing. Um, I thank you all for coming by tonight. Um, of course, if you ever want to come back in the future, um, if you really enjoyed this stream, if you really enjoyed our community, I'd love to um, see you again. I'd love to fellowship with you some more. Um, every single Tuesday night on this channel, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we do a game stream where we play uh, games on the channel. We are variety. We do a lot of different things. Uh, we've been playing Power World currently. Uh, it's been causing problems on the stream, so I'm not sure if we're going to do it again this week. Uh, we might do something else instead. Um, not sure about that. I'll let you guys know whenever I get a better idea. But Tuesday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, game night. Uh, Wednesday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we do the Bible study stream. Uh, so as you can see, we've been going through the book of Exodus. We would love, uh, we're going to keep going through it, and we'd love if you kept joining us on this journey to go through it. Um, but yeah, having a great time. Uh, also, if you uh, want to do more stuff than just be part of the stream, we also have the Discord channel that I linked a little bit above. Uh, you can join there and talk with us there. Um, or, as well, if you want to come play games with us, we have a public Minecraft server that anybody can join linked in the Discord. Uh, we'd love to have you there play with us. Um, or, it, we also have a Clash Royale clan that, uh, you know, Dietrich hosts. So if you want to come play games with us, we've got the Minecraft server. Crossplay between Bedrock and Java version. Don't ask me how that works, but it does. And we also have the Clash Royale clan that you can join as well. Um, we'd love to have play games with you there or join you in the Discord or anything like that. Uh, oh, gosh. Pizza. Oh, my gosh. You joined at a bad time. We're going to raid someone. The raid timer already started. <laughs> Wait, real quick. Just cruising through the Christian tag and just wanted to encourage you to continue to representing Jesus here on Twitch and commend you on being unashamed of the gospel. Thank you, Pizza. Thank you so much for that. That's a heartwarming message to end the stream on. Um, I wish I could talk with you more, but the raid timer is just about to go through. Uh, Kodo007, he's a good friend of ours, uh, does Worship Wednesdays on his channel. He's another Christian streamer. Um, so we're going to go raid him real quick. Uh, I know I got a little bit of time, but Pizza, thank you so much for the follow. I wish I had more time to talk to you. I wish I didn't already start the raid, but I can't really do much about it. Uh, go let Kodo know that you love him and that God loves him. Spam in his shot, God loves you. And I love you guys. I'll see you next time. <laughs>